party of people. It's time. I got my I got my letter from Hogwarts. I got a message from John Connor of the future, and Batman has called me to be the next Robin. Everything is lining up, and that can only mean one thing. It's time for another Rage Select podcast, but it's not just any Rage Select podcast. You, all this week, we had fucking world famous author and, and man who, who tells you how to make poop smells, Jason Murphy, and we're playing Dark Souls 3. But now we have the internationally super famous uh, man of history. Uh, he knows everything. He's, I'm pretty sure he's a time lord, and he just hasn't told me, and that is fucked up, Nick, because I want to ride. I don't even need to go to a different time i just want to like have a burger in the tardis and the fact that you will not let me do that really pisses me off time lord nick hodges is here with us everybody give him a hand Woo! Woo! Oh, thanks man <laughs> good, good to, to be, be back, back. Mm-hmm. yeah it's been uh it's been a bit you've been uh you're a busy man you're hard i had my people by which i mean my dog call your people and i don't even know who they are <laughs> but he just he told me that he was like nick is busy but it sounded more like a dog voice Nick is busy. I don't know. Uh, believe me, I I really wanted to do that. Uh, you know, a few shows at the. Uh, I just uh, been busy, like as you can say. Uh, I mean, like because uh, I've been moving out. Uh, I was moving out at the time. Are you? Are you? Doing... Are you moving on up? Is that? Oh my God! Are you moving on up? You're living the. You're living the dream, Nick. All right, so you moved out. Yeah, we moved out. Well, uh, technically, no. I moved out with my mum, basically, to a smaller flat, uh, oh. and. Uh, and that was a bit hectic because uh, it was not just like my room I had to sort out. It was like a house that we've all lived in for 22 years and taking all the furniture and going to a smaller place. That means like throwing a lot of crap in the in the rubbish tip or I guess the dump, You I guess you would call it. So wait, wait, that, the, that was, wait the yeah. garbage dump in Britain is called the rubbish tip? Yeah. That yeah. is awesome. I want to officially <laughs> make all gar because garbage dump. It just sounds like it's just like it's it doesn't sound but but rubbish tip. I mean that sounds like like uh <laughs> like somebody threw out like something really cool and like you were online and then you got a hot rubbish tip. You were like, Oh man, did you see that couch uh, that that guy threw out? It's like it's brand new. I don't even know. It's got like a little wine stain. Flip that cushion over, man. Is a hot rubbish tip for you coming in from Twitter. <laughs> So that's a good way of putting it, I guess. <laughs> so you moved, uh, you moved into a smaller place with your mom. Yes, yeah. And uh, and she is now what the she's the official social secretary for history buffs. She's doing oh, scheduling all I your wish. meetings. No, 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 no. I'm doing that all by myself, and I'm hating it because I'm very dyslexic and I'm very unorganized. So trying to juggle multiple things at once is pretty bad for me. I mean, I could. I could pursue something relentlessly, but can only do like one thing at a time. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I'm looking forward to the day when I can hire a secretary or an assistant or something, but uh, definitely can't do that right now. So, okay. Well, tell the good people of Rage Select, I'm sure that they are all subscribed. I'm sure they are all <laughs> subscribed to the History Buffs YouTube channel, right? Okay, good. Now that we've got my threatening voice out of the way, what what have you been what have you been doing with the buffs? I've just I've been I'm sorry, Nick. I I I would love to keep a closer eye on your channel, but you know, Dark Souls three came out, and it's no, kind no, of it's a big fine, deal man. around here. I I know how much you were looking forward to that game, so I, it's absolutely fine. <laughs> just a little, just a smidge, just a little bit. So yeah, yeah. but what do you what have you been up to? Uh, well, about a few weeks ago, I got contacted by the History Channel. Um, yeah <laughs> and uh, they have, apparently they saw my um apparently they saw my vikings video where i made like uh predictions of what was going to happen in season four mm-hmm. based on the history books i've been reading mm. and uh i got a lot right so they asked me whether i'd be interested in uh flying out to ireland and doing a podcast series promoting season four of vikings and interviewing the cast and crew of the show so is it just, it's like you sitting down with a bunch of like really, really ripped young people who are all just like in the best shape of their life with big beards talking about, about Vikings? Yeah, pretty much. I would be like actually flying out and uh, uh, to Ireland and going onto the set. So you got like the, the Viking village of Kattegat and you get to see the, like the Paris throne room and uh, talking to all the actors uh, about the show. Uh, it was 
it was it was a pretty cool time. Unfortunately, though, it took time away from me doing um, history buffs as often as I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I just finished the last podcast with them, and I just kind of uh, finished with Vikings it, for this part of season four, anyway. As so I'm back to doing kind of history buffs frequently, although uh, apparently the History Channel <laughs> they uh, they really liked my uh, my podcasts and. Uh, a lot of opportunities are presenting themselves in the future. I like I, I like the idea that okay, so I, I know that this is not what's happening, so allow me to not plant paranoid conspiracy theories in your mind, Nick. But I like the idea that the the history is it the history channel that makes us? Who's it that makes um, us? Yeah, yeah, the yep. history channel, yeah. Okay. That they're like they listen to your podcast, and you're like, shit, man, he is spoiling the entire next season of Vikings. Like, well, how do we stop him? <laughs> it's like, I know. Get him up here and put him in front of a bunch of hot chicks and then make him do a podcast. And it'd be like, all right, but that's only gonna last for like four episodes. Like, no, no, I know how to do this. Let's hire him to do the official podcast and get him to Actually, stop spoiling this bullshit. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if you were uh, uh correct on that assessment. All right. So, you know, as uh, you and I have known each other for a long time and I have I need I need you to do me a favor. I need you to get on the set of Game of Thrones and then I need you to get me as your personal assistant onto the set of Game of Thrones. And then I can I'll I can be the one that's dating one of the Game of Thrones I don't care who. I don't care. The dudes, the ladies, the dragons, fucking uh, the mountain. I don't give a fuck who it is. I just want to like I just want to date somebody on Game of Thrones. I mean, I prefer, you know, um Cersei Lannister, I guess, but you know, she she seems pretty cool. She's got her her, her shit together. She does, you know, she's been publicly shamed. She knows what's going on. We got we got to have a lot to talk about about the internet, yeah, you know. Yeah. I'm sure that you would put it out at the last minute because like when I I met the main actress of Vikings and it was my first ever interview I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> so like I, I I arrive in Dublin, I get off the plane and they're like, "Oh, you're going to be doing the interview with her the next day. We have the whole day to prepare." I'm like, oh, "Okay, awesome." And they're like, oh, sorry, she changed the schedule. You have an hour to do it. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? And I arrive at a house, and she's, uh, I was shitting myself. What's her name? I, I don't know. Be... I don't watch Vikings. What's her, what's her name? Do you uh, know? Her name's uh, Catherine Winnick. So she plays the character of Lagatha, like Ragnar's wife, uh, ex-wife in the show. Ooh. Uh, yeah. And I, uh, but fortunately, so uh, at the very beginning, she was a bit cold and distant to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, because she just thought it was like another interview. But once I turned out to be a proper geek and I knew every single scene that she was in, then she kind of warmed up to me and she was cool. And then like right after that, like uh, I had a blast doing it because everyone was really, really sweet in the show. But it was really intimidating, I got to say, because I felt like right before I got into her house, I felt like um, like I was thinking in my head like, oh, God, I've been bullshitting everyone. The fact that I could do this. What the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> 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 oh man, I'm just imagining like a scene from. I mean, I'm sorry, Nick. I'm imagining like a scene from like a Hugh Grant movie or something of you out there, like ring the doorbell and then you're on the porch, with your head down, going like, "Get it together, Hodges. Get it together. You can do this. You are worth it. You're good." And then it looks like you look up. She's had the door open the entire time, and you're just like. And of course, being British, I know that all of you people like your the worst fear in life is any amount of social uh, uh, embarrassment. So that it's like you just throw yourself off of the front steps onto the yeah you just yeah you just got me in a nutshell that's for sure (laughs) well that's that's cool um what so uh, do you want to give people do you want to give people like a a teaser or anything for your next your next thing that's coming up or you want to just say you know just be like stay tuned you jerks no no absolutely uh well i've been working on uh, the movie lawrence of arabia uh for a while i was writing vigorously whilst i was doing vikings so it's being edited. It sh- should hopefully be out by the time people listen to this podcast. And then the next review I'm doing will be uh, Goodfellas. Ooh. I, I thought I'd be changing it up a little bit. Uh, so I still consider it history. I just haven't done a gangster movie then yet. So I was like, what is the the best true gangster movie out there? And I was thinking Goodfellas. Okay. Do you want to, do you want to know something about me that if we were standing face to face, you would probably slap me upside the face for saying? 
Absolutely. Okay. Uh, to this day. <laughs> Just to do that. <laughs> uh, by the way, yesterday was my birthday as of, as of when this podcast comes out. But Happy birthday, mate. Yes, thank you very much. I don't want to harp too much on that. I will be a 38-year-old man who has never actually sat down and watched Lawrence of Arabia, except when I was a teenager and I sat down to watch Lawrence of Arabia, and I actually turned it off about an hour in and went, boring, was so Spider-Man isn't even in this movie. Fuck. You know? um, and it, yeah. And so whatever. Moving I see, on. <laughs> when, 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 and, you know, you know me as like uh, like half the people that I hang around with in Austin are uh, are big, you know, they're big movie buffs. Right. They're all like this. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. the cinema, you know. And so it's like, uh, you know, we'll be at a bar or something and people will be like, oh, man. And, and I just I, oh, I just got the Blu-ray last week for Lords of Arabia. It's like, oh, man, it's so good. Oh, it's so. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah, he. He uh, he, Lawrenced that place up proper, you guys. He was. You haven't seen it, have you? You son of a bitch. No, I did. I saw it. It was about a man. His name was Larry or something. He was in. He was. He was Larry and Larry of Arabs. Um, yeah. Anyway, well, before we get to the gaming news, well, uh, before we get to before we get to the gaming news, just real quick, have you have you been playing anything? I, I it sounds like your 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 time has been basically just all big boy grown-up work and no yeah. like video <laughs> shooting of pew pews um i actually played a little bit of metro today for about an hour oh okay all right so if that counts i haven't played anything at all so like i had like an hour to spend like fuck it i'm gonna do something i want to do for a change i'm gonna play video games I feel like I need to, I feel like, you know what I feel like would be good, good for you now, Nick? I mean, I know that it's not really your particular forte, but I feel like you should really buy yourself a Nintendo 3DS because, you know, no. if you're going to be traveling, <laughs> if you spend some time on a plane, then it's like, ah, you just whip your 3DS out, play some Fire Emblem or some uh, the Bravely Second or Phoenix Wright or something like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a big Nintendo fan. You know me. <laughs> yep, I do. I do. All right. Well, I tell you what. Let's get into uh, the pre-news news. So I have something good to put in on the thumbnail for this to make people think that we talked about it for an hour and a half. Um, so first up, there was a trailer this week for Doctor Strange, um, which I d Nick, do you know? Do you know about Doctor Strange? Do you know? I don't know anything about comic books, really. I mean, uh, I knew about the character because I uh, was I, I like the Marvel Cinematic Universe and I kind of researched a little bit about him. Um, I, I'm curious. I don't think the trailer was anything special, though. Okay. Well, it, no, but, but then again, I guess there's a proper tease. It's like it doesn't fulfill, uh, fill uh, a lot of information out. Right, right. No, but I think that the, the thing that I'm actually thinking that you might not know is that um, one of the writers for Doctor Strange was actually C. Robert Cargill from Spill. What? Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. Like, he actually... Cargill. Yeah, he went to... Uh, actually, it's funny. I don't know why I never thought of this. I probably should have. I don't know if you guys are even friends on Facebook, but he was, like, over there while they were filming, um, like, hanging out with uh, with old, old Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, you know, talking about Doctor Strange and stuff, so... Yeah, he was telling a story on last week's uh, live show on on the one of us cast about Benedict Cumberbatch calling him R Robert for a while until he was like, "Yeah, I, I don't usually go by that." But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I think this trailer looks pretty cool. I mean, I also am not really like, you know, I don't really truck all that much with Doctor Strange. He's one of those characters that like I know of, and I've read a couple of. I read one Fantastic Four story that featured him pretty heavily. That was pretty cool. But I don't know. This trailer looks pretty nifty. I mean, you know, he's Tilda Swinton's shaved her head and just punching his soul out of his body. And then New York is like double incepted, right? It's like folding over twice I'm on glad itself. glad you said that. I was thinking Inception when I was watching the trailer. <laughs> uh, but I, I mean, I really like the the... I really like that the trailer like has a lot of intense like visuals going on in it um like these these places where it's like people walking through like these hallways that are folding over and disappearing and shredding and all kinds of craziness um yeah i'm definitely interested because like they haven't shown uh that much magic in the in the marvel movies yet so i mean like I guess they do a little bit with Thor, but uh, this would be kind of something interesting. Well, but that's actually that's a really interesting point. One that I was thinking about bringing up is that I don't know how they're going to square this because so far, 
the Marvel movies have all demonstrated or have all taken the the stance that like all the people in Thor are supposed to be there. It's basically like an, an, an other plane and they don't have magic. They just have like superior technology. I mean, I guess there's some parts where Thor is all like kind of like winky winky about how the hammer works. But um, this will be the first time of like just straight up, you know, sorcerers. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, which will be interesting. I'm trying to think of like, I know a lot, I know a lot more about the DC magic lineup than I do about the Marvel magic lineup and how magic works in the Marvel universe. Um, I do know it's kind of strange that what it's like Dr. Strange, he was a surgeon, he gets in a car accident. And then the big problem is that after the car accident, his hands won't, he doesn't have the dexterity to be a surgeon anymore. And then it's like, he gets recruited by some, some magic dudes and they're like we'll teach you how to do good stuff with magic instead of with the scalpel and does he uh get his hands fixed with magic nope i believe i don't believe so i i i don't know i mean that's the thing is that i've never really read like i don't even know who dr strange's enemies are i i all i really know is, is dr strange and then he's got like um the he's got like a an assistant and he lives in the tower that has like the the like circle window with some shit on it like in this move in this trailer is it the um is I, i'm sorry is that actor's name is that the guy with whose name is almost impossible to pronounce chuwedgy chuwedgy edgy for i'm sorry i'm so sorry um the guy that was uh. in serenity who was like the assassin in serenity um oh god i can't remember okay hold on i, I will find out it is Yes, uh, his name is uh, Ch- Chiwetel Ejiofor. Um, is he British? I have no idea. Uh, he was in Serenity. He was in Children of Men. Um, he was in The Martian. Um, but he's in there, like, walking around with a sword, and I have no idea. Let's see. He was born in London, according to Wikipedia. Uh, Edge of Four was born in London's Forest Gate to Nigerian parents of I- Igbo or Ijbo, I'm not sure, origin. So, uh, but he was, I mean, like, I always, whenever I go back and watch Serenity. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know that guy. I just looked him up at Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know who I'm talking about. Um, yeah. he, was, he, was in, he was in 12 Years a Slave, right? He was like, the main guy in 12 Years a Slave, right? Um, yeah, yeah. British guy. Yeah. He was. Um, like I, whenever I go back and watch Serenity, you remember him in that movie, right? Like I never watched Serenity. I ah! haven't even finished Fire. I haven't finished Fire- Firefly yet, though. It's made it like to episode seven, and I never continued. Okay, now we're equal. So you haven't seen Serenity, and I haven't seen Lawrence of Arabia. We both know what we're going to do this weekend. Is all right, fine. Those two are obviously <laughs> equal. <laughs> um, no, but he's he was really good at there. Like I, everything I've seen him in. He plays uh, relatively similar characters, it seems, but, like, I, I like him as an actor. Like, he does – he's very intense, you know. He does real good, like, emotional just uh, – so, um, yeah, that's my that's my, uh, my my glittering commentary for today is just uh, – just uh, he's just uh, – uh. but anyway, um, I don't know. Like, this is the – we've got two – we got two Marvel movies this year, Civil War and then Doctor Strange. And no matter what else you say, I can say that just from a visual perspective, I think this looks like it might be more interesting than um, Ant-Man. And I'll take Benedict Cumberbatch and Tilda Swinton. You can just have him do anything. I don't give a fuck. I'll watch that movie. I like both of them. <laughs> um, all right. The next up, there was a new Suicide Squad trailer. And uh, this is the the Blitz trailer, uh, and I, man, Nick, I, boy, the first Suicide Squad trailer didn't do very much for me at all. But uh, the more trailers they put out, the more I get like super freaking excited about this movie. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, and I think it was a good timing of them to release this episode, uh, this trailer. Uh, you know, when they were doing the whole reshoot. Thing and people say, oh, they're just reshooting stuff to make it funnier. It was like, wow, that's perfect timing, right? After watching, you know, Batman v Superman, for them to actually go and reshoot entire scenes within two weeks. 
Yeah, I, I it's funny because somebody somebody on uh Rage Select I, I've said that that same thing a bunch of times and somebody on Rage Select kind of uh poo pooed me for it and I went and looked it up and apparently there was actually what is it um is it David Ayer? Is that the guy that's that's mm-hmm. directing it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. D- tweeted the other day of like, we're not reshooting to make it funnier. We're just we're doing reshoots because you just you do reshoots from time to time. But um, in any case, I don't know. It looks like it looks even if it's it just looks a lot more fun. It looks fun. I guess that's what even all the trailers for Batman versus Superman or Man of Steel or any of that stuff. None of them looked fun. This at least, even if they've just hammed it up in the trailer and the actual movie doesn't have, if, if we've already seen all the best lines in the trailer, uh, okay, as long as it's still a fun action movie, that's great. Because um, it looks like it has at least some lighthearted elements to it. Uh, and also... I don't know. I, I, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, pretty cool lines in it because I, would, I thought that the, when I saw the, the second ep, uh, trailer... Mm-hmm. I mean, sorry, the very first trailer, and uh, they still managed to deliver some really funny lines. Yeah, yeah, I, I I hope so. I mean, I hope that like I there's uh you know there's the line in there about or where the this marine guy over there like leader is is telling them how you know how don't anybody piss me off and Harley Quinn is like I've been known to be vexing like it's um, yeah. do you know that guy? He's in the the Killing, I think the the TV show. Oh, uh, you know me. I don't. I don't. Just I just don't keep up well with anything. Uh, That's an old TV show, man. It didn't come out that long ago. But anyway, yes. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. It looks real fun. It looks real action packed. It looks real. I, I don't know. I mean, like, and the thing is that I don't really have any real strong feelings one way or the other about Suicide Squad. But then this trailer actually showed. I mean, we already knew. We've already seen glimpses of the Joker, but now we've seen glimpses of Batman in here too, and it's just like. I could really go for a movie, Nick, that has Batman in it that isn't about Batman. That's I could really go for just like, and then Batman shows up in the last ten minutes, and we're just like, oh shit, it's the Batman. Let's get out of here. And then we did, and it was good. Or no, you're right. I mean, it's it's still set in his kind of universe. I just wish they could get Superman's world correct. No, that's that's the bummer. I don't want to go down that road a third time i just ah, fair I, enough. I've, I've i you are more than welcome to talk about anything you want to talk about about superman but i have complained about it so much <laughs> so so much <laughs> okay i mean like yes you've had been able to to bitch about the movie i haven't all i've been able to do is talk about history and uh vikings and stuff so i haven't had i've been able haven't been able to vent so. yeah throw no dude throw it out give me give me give me five minutes about batman versus superman and i won't say no, anything i won't say no, anything. it's okay we, we, you got a show to do so you know <laughs> i'm simply along for the ride i don't know we might <laughs> circle back to that as i kind of want to hear i just <laughs> like to hear other people talk about i got i got i was so i you know, every so often, Nick, I do shots, and that's always a bad idea. And the other day, I was at uh, uh, last week, I was talking with Brian Salisbury, and he was like, "Superman's boring," and I was like, "You're boring!" And <laughs> like he was, he we started arguing about Superman, and I just got really upset. Like I got really personally upset, and it was stupid. And I I wouldn't have been upset if I'd been sober, but I don't know. I I just have been all. You know, the other day I came home from the bar and I was like, I want to watch the original Superman, Christopher Reeves. So I rented it on on uh, Google and I watched. I mean, like, I think I watched like three quarters of it and then passed out. Uh, <laughs> I I would have had your back, to be honest, because I'm a massive Superman fan. There's a part in the original Christopher Reeves Superman. Boy, how long has it been since you've seen that movie, Nick? Okay, but it's been maybe five, six years or something like that. It's stupid, absolutely. There's some dumb things in it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like I don't like the I don't like Gene Hackman's Lex Luthor all that much. I don't like turn the world around backwards. But there's this part that I had forgotten about, and I want to be real. You know, I was like, I want to be upfront with people about this that Jeff don't tries not to pick sides when he can, or that I believe is going to be fair. There's a part in in that movie where. Lois Lane interviews Superman and then he like holds her hand and they go flying up in the air and they go flying around in the night sky and they're flying and oh she falls and he catches her and then she's just holding on and then he puts out his hand and he's dragging her along through the air even though that wouldn't work she'd just be behind him like a flag just whipping around but um mm-hmm. but during that sequence there's this weird thing where like Lois Lane's voice she's it's like a voiceover where she's 
like composing a really bad poem about how much she likes Superman over yeah. that. And it's just like, I'd forgotten that that was there. And then I was watching it. And I was like, this is cringeworthy. <laughs> like, this is awful. <laughs> Uh, you have to remember the time it was made, I suppose. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, well, anyway, let's uh, enough dilly-dallying around. Let's get to the news. Uh, first up, this week on the news parade. Um, so, all right, this is another one of those ones that we'll probably never, ever get to hear the end of. But, uh, all right, so, Nick, there is a guy, and he is the former chief of Rockstar North. His name is Leslie Benzies. And apparently, in he was like the director of Rockstar North, and apparently in like previous times and places and days and, and games and whatever, according to an article that I'm reading on Eurogamer, like him and the Housers, the guys that write the the Grand Theft Auto games, and like they wrote Max Payne three, and they've written a bunch of games. I think they read, wrote Red Dead. Um, like his compensation with the company as the director of the studio was like on par with these two guys. Now, apparently after Grand Theft Auto V, um, they said to this guy, hey, great job. Why don't you go, go we're going to, why don't you go to New York and like six months, you just like get some downtime. You've been working super hard, spend six months over there, come on back, you know, recharge batteries and we'll get started on the next thing. And he's like, okay. And then he leaves and when he comes back, his card won't open the front door. And then when he gets the front door open, security comes and they're like, you don't work here anymore. Uh, here's oh. your box of your shit. Get the fuck out of here. Fucking hell. Um, that is dodgy. Yeah. And apparently, so apparently he is now saying, he is now suing Rockstar because he says that they basically, that, that p part of him getting fired after the game was released meant that he wasn't going to be getting the royalties that he should have from the incredible sales of Grand Theft Auto V, which were, in the beginning, part of his contract uh, employment with Rockstar. Um, so he is suing them to the tune of $150 million um, in unpaid royalties. And... Uh, that's that's his side of it. He says that they basically that they like they hoodwinked him, that they they said it for him to leave. And then while he was gone, they basically cut him out of the whole the whole organization, fired him and they're refusing to pay any of his uh, royalties. Now, on the opposite side of that, uh, Rockstar has released a statement, uh, I, which I will now read. Um, OK. Leslie Benzies was a valued employee of our company for many years. Sadly, the events that culminated in his resignation ultimately stem from his significant performance and conduct issues. Despite our repeated efforts to address and resolve these issues amicably, uh, both before and after his departure, Leslie has chosen to take this route uh, in an attempt to set aside contract terms to which he previously agreed on multiple occasions. His claims are entirely without merit and in many instances downright bizarre, and we are very confident this matter will be resolved in our favor." And then they go on to basically do this, like, at Rockstar, we believe in bananas right, and so family you, and blah, blah, blah. So you have a classic he said, he said situation. Right. right. Um, it sounds like they, like, like this sounds like one of those weird things where it's like, this sounds like a tiff that's going on with, like, the top three people at Rockstar. Like, like the the top, you know, maybe not owners, but like like really high up the food chain, not just like, oh man, I was late again. You're fired. Get the fuck out of here. Oh no, you owe me ten dollars because lunch last week. Like, oh, I'm not gonna pay you. But um, fuck you, one hundred fifty million dollars. <laughs> so I, you know, I I tell you, I have a feeling that just like uh, Bioshock Infinite and and Ko Kojima and Konami, that we might never actually figure out what the fuck is going on here. Well, I don't know. Maybe because it's actually, if it actually gets to court, then we will actually have. Um, they'll have to, you know, there'll be documents there, right? That that people can maybe get their hands on, but because um, uh, I think this will be settled, to be honest, out of court. Yeah, it seems more likely. I don't There's know. a lot of money we're talking about here. I don't know. It's. Um, I think it's interesting with this whole in the statement about um, his resignation ultimately stems from his significant performance and conduct issues. I again, I feel like. Oh man, I just I want to know. I, I I'm always so curious when something yeah. like this happens. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I mean, you got you got to have some serious balls to sue Rockstar, and 
I don't know. I, I just feel like if you didn't have any uh, shred of truth to your story, would you even try? That's that's true. I mean, you know, Rockstar is not a company. That, it's not like they've never been sued before. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. So uh, they also have a shitload of money. So there's that, too. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I'll be interested to see if this happens. But I think that the yeah. the the most interesting thing, the most interesting question is if. I don't know how instrumental this guy is because uh, we only ever know like the top one person who works at any particular company. Like we don't ever know about, you know, a person who's like a producer who really made the difference between on, on six different games that would have been garbage if you didn't ever know about this guy. I'm kind of curious to know if this is going to, if this is going to affect um, the, the next games that rockstar decides to make. Like, I don't know how instrumental this guy was and whether his departure is going to mean that things uh, end up being any different. I don't know. Um, what do you think? You think it's going to be about the same, same writing, mostly the same programmers? Uh, I think so. I mean, they're big enough by this point. Uh, I'm definitely curious to see how much truth there is to this story. Mm -hmm. Cause uh, like the, the fact that the rocks it's rock star, they could drown you in litigation because they could uh, just they could afford better lawyers than you can. So unless you had a foot to stand on, I mean, sorry, I like to stand on, then you wouldn't even try. So I think I feel like this must be some truth to what uh, he was saying. Yeah. Uh, wow, this is pretty amazing though. I just looked him up on on the old wikis, and uh, his game credits is he is a producer credit for Grand Theft Auto. Three, Vice City, San Andreas, Liberty City Stories, Vice City Stories. Four, The Lost and the Damned, Chinatown Wars, Ballad of Gay Tony, Red Dead Redemption, L.A. Noir, Max Payne 3, and Grand Theft Auto 5. Like, this guy has been there for a while. Um, that's pretty incredible. Like, at least since Grand Theft Auto 3, which, you know, at this point makes that 15 years. So, yeah. Um, anyway, we will have to see whether or not that makes any difference to the way that the Rockstar games come out. Um, let's see. Next up, speaking of litigation that may or may not be dodgy, uh, to, to appropriate your culture for a moment, Nick. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, so last week, Blizzard apparently threw a cease and desist order at the nostalrious, uh, Quotey Fingers vanilla World of Warcraft server. And let me explain this because I don't think that it probably, you know, just saying that is going to mean something to some people, but not to other people. Um, so this was apparently a private World of Warcraft server with something like 80, 800,000 registered users that was unaffiliated from Blizzard. And the reason was that it was running uh, version 1.12 of World of Warcraft. So it was running like an old version of World of Warcraft before a bunch of changes were made. I believe that an article that I read said that it was before the Burning Crusade update happened, um, which is, I don't know if you know this, Nick, but it's a thing that, that happens a lot, where especially like in MMOs, if the developers make a bunch of changes to a game, There'll be people who want to play the game the way that it used to be before they instituted all these changes, and they feel like, oh, you ruined the game. Fuck that. I just want to play version 1.0 or whatever. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so apparently this group was running a, a a downgraded version of World of Warcraft on this server that people could go and essentially play as nostalgic, and Blizzard uh, came in and was like, no, sir. Shut that shit down immediately. We're not going to get to do stuff unless we're getting paid for it. Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of, I, I think this is a really interesting story because it brings up a really interesting question about like, okay, so you have people, they paid for World of Warcraft. I know they don't own the software, right? But they did pay for a product. And let's say that they want to play a previous version of that product um, that they did pay for, like, should they be able to do that? It's almost like, you know, it, to me, part of it kind of like um, 
uh, uh, mirrors what I would think would maybe be in the argument of like, I don't want the special editions of Star Wars. I want the original garbage, shitty special effects versions of Star Wars, right? I don't, I don't need to be remastered. I want to, I want the original stuff. And so then, like back when Lucas was still doing that shit, and he was like, "Well, those don't exist anymore. I, I destroyed them. I threw them in a fire, and then I shat on the fire because I hate the original version so much." Um, it's kind of an interesting question where you say these people or some of these people maybe are people who are big fans of the game and they just want to run a previous version. So I don't know. What do you think? I know. I think that like uh, when a company gets uh, really massive, that there are some new people who kind of come in who only approach it from a business aspect, kind of away from the original vision of the game where I think if, the original developers, they'd just be glad anyone was playing their game at all, so they wouldn't have a problem with this. So the people who kind of uh, come into the company uh, recently, they don't have that sort of emotional connection with the game. They just approach it like a business. And I'm like, oh, we're losing money here because they're playing the older version of the game. Mm-hmm. But it's... I mean, I think... Who really who cares at the end of the day is my opinion, but uh, as a business standpoint... It's not. It's not unexpected. No, I could definitely see. I mean, you know, you remember that the the Metal Gear Solid remake that got shut down by Konami, and it's just like, yeah, of course. Oh, did it finally get shut down? Last oh, time yeah, we spoke, oh it, it, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah, it did get shut down, and then it got resurrected as like um, a free the muse quotey fingers the museum of Metal Gear Solid uh, with VR support. That was that was in uh, last week's news, but yeah, hey, who who didn't see that coming from a mile off? Yeah, I know? don't, I don't know. I don't. I'm only waiting for. I'm waiting to see how long it is before those <clears throat> those guys that are trying to translate Knights of the Old Republic into UE4. I don't know if they've already been shut down, but anyway, I don't know. I guess the only thing that kind of that that kind of gives me a little bit of pause here is, <clears throat> you know, Blizzard is a company. I don't really get. I don't. I don't really get a good sense of how they feel as a company about this sort of thing, but it almost seems like if you wanted to let these people, if you had 800,000 people that were on this server, maybe go to them and be like, you pay us and we'll let you keep this server up. Like if that's still dodgy though, that's still really slimy. Yeah. Well, but uh, I mean, the thing is that look, you know what I think? You know, like this rock star guy who's suing the company for like $150 million. Okay, that's the most extreme case of something like that happening. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if like uh, when a company gets, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger, the old guard is let go and the new people take over. That They're still, um, so, the, so they only own the company by the sort of brand, not by the division. The mm-hmm. So they really couldn't give a shit is what I'm thinking. Yeah. Compared to like how the... Maybe the uh, people who originally built the company, they may have left and, uh, you know, they were bought out or whatever. So there is no emotional investment in the product that they're uh, dishing out. I guess I guess the way that I'm looking at it is like, hey, um, you know, it would be nice to to show it because 800,000. OK, I, I know there aren't 800,000 people playing on that server every single day. Right. But 800,000 registered users, that's still a fair number of people who are fans of your product. And to just be like, yeah, my comment is middle finger, both middle fingers. It's kind of one of those things where you go, hey, you know, if you've got uh, almost, you know, a little shy of a million people who are playing on this server, maybe it's not the worst thing in the world to just be like, well, I tell you what, why don't we take one of the lower paid people and be like, go make this make us money. And and or if there's a if there's a big market for that, maybe even look at uh, you couldn't you couldn't. That is extremely ballsy, though. I was just thinking, like, imagine if 800,000 people were like, all right, fuck you. I'm not playing this game anymore. How much how much would they that uh, money would they lose with that? Uh, well, I mean, that's the thing is that probably most of these people aren't playing WoW well, uh, right now. Um, but uh, the, the let's see if I can't find. Here's Q4 2015 uh, subscription numbers for World of Warcraft: five point five million, according to this is just the first. Uh, it's a it's a topic. It's a it's a forum post on WoW the WoW forum. So who the fuck knows? But uh, so under under a fifth. Yeah. Of your audience disappears. 
But but that's the thing is Are it, he retarded? But I'm, no no like, no 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 no. no, no. It, but it's not. I, I'm not explaining this correctly. It's, it's not the same thing. Like I don't think the people that were running on this particular server were actual World of Warcraft subscribers. This was a private server. So I think it's entirely possible that these people. I, the problem here is that I'm not. I'm, I, mean, I read a little bit about this, but I didn't get a chance to just get all the way into it. I don't think that these people are actually paying a World of Warcraft subscription. I think they have World of Warcraft and they're using like mods or hacks or whatever to redirect the server login to a private server that is running an old version of World of Warcraft. Um, so. I don't know. I don't. I don't think that. Like, I don't think the Blizzard is losing. Probably losing any users doing this. Um, but on the other hand, you know, keeping a, a fair amount of goodwill with your audience seems like the sort of thing that would be beneficial. You know, uh, you look at those eight hundred thousand people and you say, by turning off that server, are those eight hundred thousand people going to immediately turn around and subscribe to Warcraft proper? Or are they all just going to be like, all right, well, fuck you then, and go play, I don't know, take your pick, Ratchet and Clank. There's a good chance that some of them have, like, an extra service going on with the real World of Warcraft. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. But they're just playing it for nostalgia's sake. It's entirely possible. That, though, I don't know. Uh, it's funny how you say that, and I admit it is perfectly plausible, Nick, but my mind recoils in horror at playing two different versions of a game like World of Warcraft at the same time. Like, are you telling me now that one WoW account isn't good enough for you, that you need to play the old version? And oh, God. You know what? Ever since, like, one of my best friends, he met his girlfriend through that fucking game. Which blows my mind, in a sense. And uh, so I, I wouldn't put anything past it, you know. <laughs> Fair it's enough. To totally uh, possible. Fair enough. All right, next up, speaking of um, things that are getting shut down, uh, Square Enix has canceled the... Uh, has canceled Nosgoth, the free-to-play Legacy of Kane shooter spinoff thingy that they were making. So, boo, I guess. I'm not as big a Legacy of Kane fan as some people are. Um, yeah, yeah, sort of. I mean, Soul Reaver, Soul Reaver 2, and then Legacy of Kane was the original one on the, what was it, PlayStation 1? Um I don't know. It's a, it's a franchise that I know that Jason's really into it. I never really played Legacy of Kane. Sorry, people who care. Um, but the uh, they were making this kind of like it seemed like a multiplayer shooter sort of thing where it was, but it was all kind of in the weird land of of Nosgoth. Um, so it looks like uh, servers are going to run until the thirty first of May. And you can play the game as normal, and after that point, uh, they're going to take it offline. And if you bought it, if you bought into early access for it, it's going to be uh, refunded. Oh, or if you made a purchase in the game, it was going to be free to play. So if you made any in-game purchases, they're going to be refunded to you. Um, so that kind of sucks. It's it's kind of sad that I know a lot of people who are way into Legacy of Kane and just don't are uh, just uh, you know they they feel like this is a franchise that's just been abused because nobody's making like a proper game <laughs> uh, for it or continuing it, even though it's a lot of people, you know, they just really, really enjoy that game. It was a long time ago, mate. Though. Was that what, PlayStation 1? Was it 2? Uh, Last Legacy of Kane? Okay, let's, let's just take a look. Legacy of Kane. Um, I'm not sure when the last game in that franchise was. Let's take a look. Uh... Action Adventure, Dark Fantasy, Demon Kane, Legacy of Kane, Blood Omen, Blood Omen 2. Um, let's see. I don't even know what we got here. There's a canceled one called Legacy of Kane Dead Sun that was supposed to be Windows, PS4, and Xbox 360. Wow, I never heard of that before. Uh, Legacy of Kane Defiance was on the PlayStation 2 and Xbox in 2003. Uh, Soul Reaver was 1999. Soul Reaver 2 was 2001, Blood Omen 2 was 2002, and the original Blood Omen Legacy of Kane was 1996. So it looks like uh, 2003 uh, was, the last, was the last one that came out. So. Yeah, that's been a while. <laughs> yep, absolutely. 13 years. Unlucky. Yeah. But I mean, hey, you know what? Like, it, there's a... Uh, tell me that... that um, 
you know, 10 years went by and then suddenly somebody was like, we're going to make a new Metal Gear game. And you're like, oh, shit, I love Metal Gear. And then they're like three years of development. They're like, yeah, we're canceling that. And you're like, ah, you son of a bitch. Just make it. Make something. I know, I know, but the thing is, we've been getting Metal Gear games quite frequently. Very true. It's not exactly apples and oranges, but anyway. It's not like uh, Vampire Masquerade. Then uh, that would be a different story. Right, right, all right. Um, okay, so next. <laughs> oh, boy. All right, Nick. Um, this is a really weird story. I did not see this one coming. I kind of have been trying recently to, to get back into just like, let's just talk about video games and not anything that's going to just make everybody get all pissed off about the uh, uh, things on the Internet. Even though, you know, it, every week I say stuff like I haven't watched Lawrence of Arabia that is <laughs> just have somebody, you know, listening. Stop reminding me. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So have you ever heard of a video game called Rust? Yes, although I can't remember exactly where from. Okay, 2013 uh, was a Steam early access game where uh, it's kind of like Minecraft, except that it's not. It looks better than Minecraft. You like you get you come into this world and you hunt and you get resources and then you can build yourself a house. But it's also kind of like um, Daisy in that like the it's a it's all a multiplayer thing where people. Uh, will band together in, in groups and then they'll try to fuck each other over. Like a lot of it is people running around completely nude. Like I had a friend who told me about it who was like, yeah, I loaded it up and I was playing for a little while and then a naked dude with a giant wang walked up to me <laughs> and they chased me and they killed me and they took all my things and then they handcuffed me to a tree. Or no, that's a uh, that's Daisy. But apparently it's kind of similar to that where you can you could build stuff. You get these airdrops that have like weapons and stuff that you can use. Uh, anyway, it's been in early access since 2003. Um, just recently, uh, the developers added a new thing to the game. Now, in the beginning... It used to be that when you spawned in Rust, you your character model was a bald white guy. Uh, just okay. bald, naked white dude. Now they have changed it so that you are randomly, it is chosen that you will be white or black, a bald, black du- or bald dude, and man or woman. And so when you spawn, you're either a man or a woman, and you're either black or white. And that is completely random, and you have no, uh, absolutely no control over it whatsoever. Now, the kicker here is that that assignment for your account is permanent, and you can't re-roll, you can't change it, you can't do anything. Once you spawn in, that character, that archetype, that combination is attached to your Steam ID, and you got no way to change it. So this has, as you could probably imagine, Nick, upset quite a few people, including people who logged in to find that their character had apparently been changed because they just went oh, through, <laughs> re-rolled the entire server. Um, there was a big... Uh, there, I read a note over on The Guardian from um, from the developer who's just like, yeah, well, we don't think it matters, so it's just fuck it. You just, yeah, you just, you're, that's who you're going to be. And, like, we don't care if you're upset or you stop playing the game or whatever. Um, so that is a pretty bold move. Um, and to me, well, first off, what do you think, Nick? What do you, th- what do you think about that, Nick? I think that's a really dumb idea. I mean, like, I think what you should do is, like, at the beginning, when you can design your character, is to give you the option of being, you know, a black or white or whatever, but just to have it select for you, I mean, that takes the, the fun out of the game. Do you think so? Yeah, because you could, like, you know, the whole purpose of a game like that is for immersion. You could design your character to look like yourself or someone that you want him to look like. Well, okay, so just to, just to be clear, as near as I could tell... Before this change happened, everybody, you weren't, like, altering your character's features at all. Everybody spawned as just, like, the same generic white dude, I think. I think. I, uh, again, I haven't played Rust because I'm not interested in having a bunch of naked dudes wangle their dangles at me and take all my shit. Uh, that's not right. my idea of a fun video game. But 
Um, I, I don't know. You know, I, it's funny because I, I kind of agree. Like, the, well, or, or not necessarily. I don't. Hmm. Here's the thing. I mean, that th- they should add the the option to tr- uh, customize your character. Mm. But if if there was no choice whatsoever and everyone was white, then you know, fuck it. Yeah, I suppose it's all right to have it be randomly selected. You I know, suppose. what I think the most interesting thing here's the here's the thing is that I don't want to get too hung up on that stuff because I everybody's going to have a different opinion, right? Some people are going to be violently incensed. Uh, because they want to play. I mean, I know, I know people. In fact, you just said it. A lot of people they want to play a game, and if they have the option to customize a character, they want the character to look as much like themselves as humanly possible because that gives them greater immersion into the game. Um, I talk to people on Rage Light who are just like, uh, you know, they every time that they come up to a new game where you have a character creator, they try to make the character look as much like themselves as humanly possible because then it's like they see a little avatar of them running around the world. Now, personally, I don't give a fuck. The orc, Pac-Man, wavy line, the wind. I don't give a fuck who the avatar is, so it doesn't matter to me. You'd be Bayonetta, you could be fucking an orc uh, or whatever, and it doesn't matter. So it doesn't. I don't really care, but I definitely understand that the world and me are two separate places, and some people really do care. So what that, at least to me, seems to lead to is this thing. All right, Rust is... $20 on Steam right now, and it is an early access game. So technically, the game is not finished, so this update represents a step towards the final release version of Rust and what it will be like when it goes to, excuse me, full release when it comes out. Okay. That. But this game has been in early access since December of 2013. There's also, I believe, that one of the articles that I read said 3.5 million people have purchased Rust so far. So, you know, do the math on that. So you kind of have a a question. The question that I feel is most most, uh, pertinent is if a developer makes a change like this that was never indicated when you first purchased access to the early access game, are you entitled to get your money back? Like, if you feel like that that has it, because what you bought into was technically an unfinished game with unreleased features, unplanned features, that is currently still in development. That's what early access means, right? That's a really good question, actually. Um, I mean, to be honest, I, I just, I hate this whole uh, buying a game thing before it's even been finished. Sure. I don't even know why it's a, why, why it's even an option. But, uh... I could, yeah, I could see what the player uh, has justifications for being pissed off about it. Yeah. And I think game developers should understand that. Yeah. It's like, well, you're charging it. No, no. I'm, I'm with the players on this one. Yeah. I mean, and the thing is that... Uh, the, here's the other thing. The thing to remember as well, right, is that people... Is that it isn't everybody. Like, you know, you can go online, you can see that there are a bunch of people that... Um, that don't like the game, you know, there, but there are people that do like the game. Like even in this article on the guardian that I'm reading, it's like, they've gotten messages from players who are like, yeah, I really like that idea. They've got messages from players who are like, I hope your mother dies in a fire. I hate it so much. Or, you know, they've gotten basically yay and boo and everything in between those two statements. But for me, I'm not really as interested anymore in arguing about like, whether is it right or is it wrong or is it whatever to me, it's just like, should the people who have a problem with this be able to get their money back? And I think that in a lot of ways you could make a really, a really well argued case about saying that it's an interesting discussion to have about saying, if you're going to make an early access game and let's say that these guys knew they were going to do this somewhere down the line, were they then, should they have then been required to have outlined that that was a thing that they were probably going to develop in the design documents for this game that a person could read before they made the decision to purchase it or not. Because buying a game that plays one way and then having a developer change that thing after you've put a gajillion the hours into it, I don't know. It's it's just a really tricky question. And it's, I I agree with you. And one of the ways that like, I don't think that games that are that unfinished that don't have core like things that, that, that don't have core features already in them, it's maybe better to 
to really push the like you could buy this, but we may change the whole game at any time aspect of early access or uh, put your, you know, the other thing that would be kind of nice is that the developers put their money where their mouth were and they were like, if you really hate it that much, we'll give you your $20 back, you know, um, which they will not do, which they uh, probably won't do, probably won't do. Anyway, I tell you what, that's enough of all this heavy bullshit. We got some cool trailers this week and we're also just fucking uh, as always way the hell over time. Um, so let's roll through these pretty quickly. First up, there is a teaser trailer for Titanfall 2. What? <laughs> Yay. Uh, did you play Titanfall? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, of course you did. Yeah. <laughs> so you question me. Sorry about that. Did it come out while Rage Select or Spill was a thing? Yes, I did play it. Um, right. Okay. <laughs> actually, you know what? Uh, Titanfall, I, I've played a little bit of, but I haven't played that much. And do you want to know why? Why? Because it came out the same week as Dark Souls 2. <laughs> ah, okay. Makes sense now. Yeah. It's funny because I could tell you when certain games came out based on when other games around them came out. Like, I could tell you right now that Until Dawn came out the same week as Metal Gear Solid Five because I didn't play Until Dawn because, fuck you, Metal Gear Solid Five <laughs> was out. <laughs> Um, I don't know. This trailer doesn't. It's a. It, this is the very definition of a teaser trailer. It doesn't really say that much. It's more just like uh, you either live a hero or you fuck a villain or whatever. I don't know. And then a big robot leg comes down, and there's a little drop pod, and then you know we'll get more later. But um, I do like the fact that it seems like that they listened to the feedback from the first Titanfall and that they're making more of like a single player story this time around because. I like- As opposed to having no single player story in the first one. Right, right. Um, so June twelfth, we're going to get the full reveal. I don't know. I liked the way that Titanfall played. I just wish that it had more. I wish that it had more story. And so, if they do what Titanfall did, but they put a full single player campaign in there, where I can call down robots and I can use those robots to blow shit up, and it's not just bot matches. Great, I'll play the shit out of that game. Um, it was it, yeah, it was real fun. You you didn't play Titanfall, did you? No, not at all. I mean, you know, I played it in the beta, and then I played it when it came out, and it was real fun because it's like you know you're on foot, but you can still blow up these big robots, and then you got these AI kind of creeps walking around, and it's like yeah, excellent. Uh, so if they do single player, uh, great. That's I'm all I'm all on board. Uh, next up, uh. Is it just me, Nick, or is Gears of War the most emo franchise of all time, at least according to the trailers? Not the game. Like, the game's good action and Lambit and fucking things, but another fucking trailer <laughs> with some soft, sad rock and roll and Marcus Phoenix it, planting a tree and shit. <laughs> it, it was just, like, trying to capture the essence of the, what was it, uh, the second trailer of game uh, Gears of War 2? I, I thought it was the first one, the Mad World well, one. I th- I, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, Mad World. Was it the first one or the second one? I thought it was the first one, but I... I... Okay, may- okay, maybe you're right, yeah. But, like, it, it for some reason, that song worked very, very well. And this just seems kind of phoned in, you know what I mean? It, it just did... It, it... What's the name of the song? I was just watching it five minutes before we recorded I can't even remember what the song was. Fuck, what was the song? What was the goddamn song? <laughs> shows you how effective the trailer is if you can't even remember it the sounds of silence by uh um uh what's it simon and garfunkel yeah but but sung like even more softly and emo-ly by some dude um most emo than simon and garfunkel already yes (laughs) there's no necessary it's not necessary like mad world the trailer song actually added something it was something different from the original this is shite it just sounds like what uh like uh, some guy in a college dorm room with a YouTube channel would do like his cover of the bullshit fucking song. (laughs) Um, Well, the trailer itself, I mean, it's just like it, it goes between basically like, Oh, Marcus Phoenix had a kid and he's so happy. And then it like keeps flashing forward into the future. where like, Oh, Marcus Phoenix kid is being chased. And then he comes back home and the tree that his dad planted. Now it's, it's knocked over and he's getting behind it. And he's taken, Chest high cover. Ooh. It's like, um, okay, cool. I mean, I don't know. It doesn't really, like, I, I played Gears of War 3. I played Gears of War Judgment. 
that in and of itself isn't enough to, you know, is, is the implication here that Marcus Phoenix is dead or that his wife is dead or that somebody is somebody dead or is he just running from one monster? I don't I like. I, it, <laughs> it doesn't really show any creativity because it's trying to emulate a past trailer rather than, rather than trying to do something new with it. Yeah. Plus, uh, it, since that trailer, since the Mad World trailer came out, numerous other game trailers have done the same thing. Like, um, <laughs> do, do you remember when Bad Company 2 was taking the piss out of that trailer? Yes, I do. <laughs> I was so appreciative that they were doing Oh, that. damn it, Dice. <laughs> Stop. I, okay, I like Star Wars Battlefront and everything, but I want Bad Company 3. I need to remember yes! that. Every oh time God. somebody yeah. writes in and they're just like, what franchise would you like to get a sequel to that d- that doesn't have a sequel? Be like, Bad Company. I loved both of those. One and two, they were super fun games. And it was like just this crazy cast of crazy, crazy people. Exactly. They, they make they fucking made fun of Metal Gear. And I was like, great. That was that was fantastic. Uh, <laughs> all right. Next up, uh, Attack on Titan. Ah! I'm guessing you're a fan of the the TV show, right? I am. It's it's. I, I'm I'm not as big. Of, I know a lot of people who are just like mega fans of Attack on Titan. I'm like Attack on Titan. It was pretty good. Uh, boy, they cry a lot in that show. Like, there's the main character. He just he just weeps like a baby constantly. And like, I understand you live in a world where giant naked people without penises uh, keep eating other people, keep eating your friends, and that's pretty horrifying. But on the other hand, like. Dude, like, okay, just cry until you're done crying and then stop crying. Um, anyway, but this trailer, um, I, there's already been a shitload of footage about this game. I don't know. This is made by the same people who make, like, the uh, the Dynasty Warriors games. Um, I could see that. Yeah, it looks pretty solid. Like, I like the, the art style. Translates pretty well. It's, like, slightly cell shaded but not, um, like, irritatingly so. And... Um, it looks real frenetic, like use little things to to bop around. You've uh, you you're not a you don't watch the show, do you? I think I watched like three episodes or something like that. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, a lot of screaming yeah. and getting eaten by titans a- and things. Angry crying. It's like when people are, like really pissed off, but they still got tears in their eyes. It's something only Japanese people are able to do. Oh yeah, yep, yep. Um, but I don't know. I like. I'm actually kind of looking forward to this because it looks like something that's. That's a little different from the usual Dynasty Warriors shtick, and I want to zip around with uh, big exacto knives and cut uh, the arms off of uh, naked people with no wings. So call me crazy, but also it's your shtick. Yeah, <laughs> I tell you <laughs> what, what you like to do. I tell you what, Nick. I just started watching this new anime called uh, Assassination Classroom, and the logic of that show makes Attack on Titan look like like a fully serious and realistic take on take your pick. So <laughs> um, anyway, next up uh, home front. They're still, they're still making home front. They're still making this fucking game, man. <laughs> <sighs> I mean, okay. I'm going to tell you right now, the hearts and minds trailer for home front, the Resolu- revolution it doesn't look bad. I hope it's the resolution. I really do. <laughs> it doesn't look bad. It doesn't look like a bad game. It does look like the most generic game I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, it's like, oh, okay, so we've got an open world Philadelphia that's taken over by North Korea, and the resistance is taking back the places, the sectors one at a time by kicking out the the Koreans, just horrible Koreans, and and. <sighs> Yeah. Yeah, like I just I watch it and it's like, oh, this is just Far Cry but in Philadelphia or Saints Row but with a lot less actual personality or I was actually thinking Far Cry because when you can stab someone from behind, it does look like the animation from Far Cry 3. You know what it really reminds me of is Dying Light or like uh Dead Dead Island. Like it looks like a a slightly it looks like Dead Island and Far Cry had a baby and with a really shitty storyline because I mean, what the fuck? Like, I don't, what? I, I don't, I don't know. It's just, I, it's strange because I watch this and honestly, there's nothing in this trailer that is any more or less offensive than any other trailer that I've ever watched. Like, there's nothing here that looks bad. It's not going to look at the people's faces. I'm like, that doesn't even look like a person. It's just the whole concept of it just looks so rehashed from about four other games that I've already played. 
without doing anything that seems really all that interesting or different. I don't know. I mean, are you? Do you have any feelings about this, Nick? Outside of, eh? yeah, pretty much that. Yeah, I mean, like we played the, we reviewed the first one. And there was nothing particularly good about that one. Uh, I think well, wasn't one of the reasons uh, they, were, they were promoting it as being written by the guy who did the Red Dawn movie or something like that. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. The first one was written by the same guy who wrote Red Dawn. Yeah. And the, yeah. you know, the biggest thing with the first one was that the first one just stopped. Like the, the last scene of the game was the tanks were rolling into like San Francisco to liberate it or something. And then it was like game over. And I was like, but what about the tanks that are going to, I was looking to the point where we were going to get rid of these guys and take back to, all right, cool. I guess I'll play the multiplayer. Oh boy. It sucks. Um, It'll be the same thing here. Absolutely. I mean, I get, I just, I look at it and it just looks real generic. Like, uh, Dead, Dead Island and Dying Light at least had the whole, like, oh, you've got an axe and you can kill these zombies all up close. Far Cry, um, you know, Far Cry 3 and 4 had, like, charismatic villains and in interesting areas. Far Cry Primal tried to do something new with a little twist to it. You know, games like Infamous that are open world have, like, the, you know, building jumping and stuff like that. Games. It just doesn't seem to have anything that's really making it interesting. In fact, I re- what I really, really, what I really, really, really want is I want you folks that are listening to this to go into the comments, and if you're excited for Homefront: The Revolution, I want you to tell me why. I want you to to do that thing that I usually don't like when people really explain to me, like Jeff, you idiot. Here's why you should be really excited about Homefront: The Revolution because I watched this, and like I said, there's nothing wrong with it. Like if the characters were more vulgar or like the bad guys were more brutal or like the guns were crazier or like the only thing actually that I know about is that you can customize your guns on the go. So you can turn your sniper rifle into a mach- into a machine gun. And that was about it. It was one of the trailers or something like that. I was like, really that's it? Why don't I just pick up that guy's sniper rifle and drop it and pick up that guy's machine gun? Uh, you know, uh, plenty of other games have already done that. Crisis, you could fucking attach shit on the fly to your gun i um, nick and i uh, uh not nick i'm sorry you're nick uh matt frank and i are playing vanquish on sequential saturday that game will let you pick up i mean it's kind of like eh, that's not enough like you need more than just that the, there's just there doesn't seem to be that much flavor to it right it just seems like a very by the numbers kind of cardboard game and i'm sorry to anybody who's a a, a fan or who's a developer who's working on this it's just like i'm not seeing anything that's really tickling me at least in the gears of war trailer i can go eh you know, I, I could go, well, at least I have a feeling about the Gears of War trailer, which is more of an eye roll than anything else. But, you know, uh, but I tell you what, I'll tell you what game does have a lot of stuff to get me excited. And that's Severed. Um, OK, you're going to have to walk me through this because I have no idea what's going on in this trailer. OK, so this is. Severed uh, now has a release date, and this game is the next game. It's it's coming out on um, April 26th. It's going to be a Vita game, which means I'm going to actually have to plug in my Vita. I'm going to find my charger for it. Fuck. Um, so <laughs> this is made by the company called Drinkbox Studios, and Drinkbox Studios made a game called Guacamelee. Nick, have you ever played Guacamelee before? No. Guacamelee is incredible. It's about a luchador uh, who comes back from the land of the dead and has to save this this lady. And um, it's a Metroidvania game, but it's got this very distinctive art style that you kind of see is very similar to what's in this trailer. Severed, on the other hand, is this PlayStation Vita game that they're making where you play as a young woman who has had her arm chopped off, hence the name, who is able to uh, like get other arms or something like that in this really kind of weirdly creative world that's full of these crazy-looking spirits and all this like bright, colorful stuff. But then it looks like the actual gameplay itself is going to be a lot of like kind of Fruit Ninja swiping on the actual touchscreen of the PlayStation Vita. And I would like to see a game that uses touch controls very well because I don't know that many of them that use touchscreen controls very well. So uh, It looks amazing. I- I'll say that. It looks very creative. Yep. I mean, I can say right now that, I mean, I was excited about Guacamelee for a while. And even though touchscreen game isn't like kind of the biggest, isn't isn't the the highest up thing on my list. Um, those dudes did a real good job on Guacamelee. So I will be more than happy to give Severed a try because 
Uh, if you guys haven't seen the trailer for it, I'd say what I would say is, hey, listener, if you haven't seen the trailer for Severed, go look at it. If you own a Vita, if you don't own a Vita, I don't think this is going to be like a game that you have to to buy a Vita in order to play. Right. Uh, but if you do have a Vita, I'm sure it's going to be like 20 bucks and it'll be good. So. Uh, all right. Let's whip through the rest of these real fast. Um Lando Calrissian is going to be the next uh, hero in Star Wars Battlefront in the Best Pen expansion. About goddamn time. Um, <laughs> well, do you know who the last <laughs> rebel hero in Star Wars Battlefront was, Nick? No, who is that? Nyan Nub. Who? Nyan Nub. Do you know who Nyan Nub is? No, who's that? Wait, is that the racist Mexican Chinese looking alien? That Lando is flying with. Yes, yes, that oh is the my, one. What? <laughs> what? Why? And the Empire had Greedo. I'm, I can understand Greedo. Really? Because he doesn't work yeah. for the Empire. He works for the Huts. Like, there's a whole team full of stormtroopers. Yeah, 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 I understand that he's a bad guy. But like the the what's that? What's that abomination called again that you just mentioned? Nia Nub. Yeah, okay, he is, like, the butt of every Star Wars joke. You, they, you can't fucking use him. Well, too late. They already have. <laughs> that is messed up. Oh, God. So, yeah, but anyway, the next, the best pit expansion is going to have Lando. That's great. Um, and then on the Empire side, do you want to take a guess who is, who's on the Empire side? Oh, no, Jabba. <laughs> Job of the Hut in a first person shoot. It, it makes about as much sense as that, like, thing, whatever. I can't even say his name. Like, it's, I find it offensive that Lando could lose his fucking place to that thing. <gasps> oh, man, this is awesome. Um, yeah, I'm offended. Oh, God. <laughs> Dengar is who's going to be on the, the Imperial side. Do you know who that is? Probably not. It, it, is he a Bothan? No, no. <laughs> uh, you, you remember in the Empire Strikes Back when they when they have the bounty hunters when they're talking about the bounty hunters and there's one guy there that just like has a like a washcloth on his head and like a, some body armor. That's Dengar. He's actually Wait, kind of a is fan he favorite. Next to the to the dinosaur looking alien. No, that is uh, Bosk. He's a Trinidadian. He, this guy, he just looks like a guy. He just has a human face and he's got like some body armor on. Uh, and then he's got like a, a scarf, like a white wrap around his head. Um, he obviously, I think, was like the last guy because there was IG-88, Boba Fett, and Bosk, and then Dengar. But Dengar is actually a big fan favorite uh, because apparently there's, there was a lot of writing done about Dengar, um, you know, like later on in the books and stuff like that. So, ah, whatever. Uh, shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't be too big a deal. Okay. All right. Anyway, uh, <laughs> let's see. I got one more serious story, and then we're just going to get into the fun stuff. Uh, so Stardew Valley, this is more of just a, hey, congratulations. Stardew Valley has sold a million copies. Woo! All right. Hey. Uh, <laughs> I need to play that game more, so I'm just going to leave it at clapping and then say uh, that's it. Um, I was going to do this one. I'm going to skip this one. We're running a little long, too. Okay, so, yeah, Nick, um, before we, we take a break... <sighs> I talked about this on a Sunday stream, but I'm not done talking about it just yet. Okay. Have you seen... Have you seen the Ford commercials that are using Metal Gear? Yes. <laughs> Go. All right. Oh, so... I was hoping that was a parody or something like that. I really did. Mm, all right, people. So here's the thing. Konami apparently hates Metal Gear or Kojima or us or you or everybody so much that they have given Ford permission to use Metal Gear, original Metal <laughs> Gear Solid, in two of their commercials, one of which is basically a codec call between Snake and Colonel Campbell, where instead Colonel Campbell is like, uh, it's time for your next mission. And I'm going to tell you about the new Ford Focus SE with superior gas mileage. You'll be getting around everywhere. And Snake's like, superior gas mileage? And it doesn't have a hybrid <laughs> electric system? And he's like, it sure does, Snake. Like, it's just, it's the worst. Like, I don't, Nick, 
I don't. Uh, anyway, hold on. I'm sorry. Let me do the other one, and then we could we could do this. The second one is the scene where Psycho Mantis reads Snake's mind, except that he's like, I see that you're looking for a new car. I see you're interested in the Ford Fusion Titanium with its 2.0 liter Econo Boost engine. And then. Econo Boost yeah, engine? Right. How'd you know that? Okay, so <laughs> I, I talked about this, but I need to talk about it again. Who are you making these ads for? Who? Because as a Metal Gear fan, I don't think this shit is clever. It makes me just want to be like, go fuck yourself, Ford. And Konami, (laughs) both of you can go fuck yourselves. Because, um, right, like, it would be one thing if you made a commercial. Like, it would be one thing, Nick, if they made a commercial that came out around the same time as Metal Gear Solid Five, where Snake is, like, sneaking into a base, and then, like, he comes around a corner, and maybe, like, a big exclamation point comes up over his head, and the camera pans around, and it's, like, a new Ford. And he's like, oh, you know, and, like, whatever. That would be okay. But this is, like, you are you are mining like some of my childhood memories, some of my good childhood memories for no good reason. Like there's no, nobody, nobody cares. Like, what are you doing? You're just inserting your Ford into my classic video game, even though the two have nothing to do with each other. And it would be one thing if it was like a clever thing or like if the Ford was actually a metal gear or something like right, that. Right, right. Like, you know, if 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 there was a cut scene where he's about to go face a metal gear and then he comes around the corner and it's a Ford and then the Ford like stands up and makes like the metal gear Rex noise or something, right? Or like if he it, it, maybe they did the escape scene in Metal Gear Solid One where him and Meryl get ready to escape and they go into the into the into the garage and, and they're like, yeah. let's take that Jeep and he's like no, I've got a better idea. And it's like, then they just leave Revol- uh, uh, Liquid Snake in the dust and drive away in their new fucking Ford butt shit or whatever it's called. You see, because it requires effort, that's why. By doing a codec call, you could be as cheap as you want. Well, yeah, I think that's true because when I looked at the channel that this that these videos were shat out of, the fucking Ford YouTube channel, I found another video that was like Captain Planet. It was just a, an overdub uh, it, like they, it's like they're doing this whole thing, and they, the thumbnails say overdubs. Like that's a thing that we wanted to see, and it's like the planeteer, the Captain Planet planeteers all unite, and they unite to make, and it's like so the planeteers are like uh, superior gas mileage and like safety features, and then Mati is like heart, and then it's like with your powers <laughs> combined, this is the new Ford shit bird, and. <sighs> I'm like, what are you doing? All right, I've I've done yelling. Do you want to yell for a few minutes? I mean, I've yelled, so it's it's only right that I mean that it just kind of reminds me of it's it's really weird, but it reminds me of Yo MTV raps. Okay, <laughs> do you do you remember that? Not really, but I mean, I I know what it is, but I I just I didn't have Nintendo or I didn't have um. Uh... It's like this fucking channel trying to relate to the kids of today by being edgy and cool, and yet it comes out really lame and pathetic. Mm-hmm. So that that's one way of looking at it. Another way is like maybe they are, they are intentionally trying to be shit to get the fans really pissed off and talking about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, may- so, that, so I can't figure out which angle they're approaching it from. All I know is that like the one would think that the oh my god these fucking things are mostly upvoted. I don't uh, okay anyway fucking whatever. Um, the the then why is that surprising? Are you serious? Well, because fucking new Ghostbusters. You, you uh, look at the most fucking popular channels and look at how shit they are. So I wouldn't be surprised. Anyway, I, all I know is that if the purpose of these videos was to make me want to buy a Ford, you have failed. That is the only thing that I can say. And this is the last time that I really want to talk about these. But I do have a, a way that we can get our revenge on the Ford people. Uh I don't know if you saw this, Nick. You should look it up. Uh, But apparently, (laughs) a Texas firearm manufacturer called Precision Syndicate LLC um, has taken, uh, I think this is a Glock, and painted it so that it looks a lot like a zapper, like a Nintendo NES zapper. And it's awesome. And I want one, except that apparently... Uh, they got a lot of hate mail and they wanted to clarify that this was like a one-off custom thing that was made. But yeah, it's all painted like a Nintendo Zapper and that's pretty cool. So, 
I need to go get me one of those. I could take it to Ford headquarters. No, I'm not doing that. I'm not. Do- I'm, I'm making making threats of gun violence on the air. That's never been a good thing. Um. Anyway, let's finish this up. Last but definitely not least, uh, there's going to be a Dark Souls board game, and I'm happy. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was announcement of a Bloodborne board uh, game, and I was not so happy uh, because it was based on probably the weakest part of Bloodborne. But this one apparently is going to be cool, or I don't know. Uh, I do know that there's an image that John posted on Facebook of a little tiny little orange scene and smo, uh little action little figures that you're going to put on a board. So I will totally do that because, you know, the, the sickness, it is, it is real. Is real, Nick. Aren't you? you know, I just thought of something. Nick, aren't you happy that Metal Gear Solid Five finished up before you had to become an adult that was doing things and working and stuff? <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I kind of suppose so, yeah. Like, I really would have been gagging to play it. So, yeah. 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 Like, you don't even have to worry about, you know. When the... My childhood is officially ended with MGS5. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you go. All right. And that is all of the news stories that we have. We are going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we're going to answer your questions. So stick around, and we'll be right back. And we're back. We are we're back. We are back, uh, and we are ready. And we now it's time for that part of the podcast everybody loves so much. It's time for a listener question. I feel like we need a um, a jingle, like a a way to sing listener questions or viewer emails or or questions from the people. Like every week, I could do that. <laughs> and everybody could be like, "Oh God, I hate it when Jeff does that." And I'm just like, ah, "I'm gonna do it even more. I'm gonna release it on iTunes." Um, Mail at RageSelect.com is the email address that you can send your questions into. And uh, just briefly, uh, nobody's ever done this, Nick, but please don't title your email penis enlargement or you've got a package waiting for you or I've got Nigerian money for you because you would frankly be amazed how much goddamn spam one human being can get if you have an email address that's actually like on a web page where just spiders on the internet can like, you know, find it and start emailing you. I get, I don't know how many, I just get constant emails from uh, this garbage. Anyway, um, our first question this week comes from whiskey howl who says, dear Jeff and Nick, I have three questions. Uh, lately me and a few friends, uh, were talking about Bioshock one and how even do and how even do we were against a movie deep down still wanted, and how even though we were against a movie deep down we still wanted one. A working script should focus on the rise and fall of Rapture told through the, dramas pe- the drama of people crossing each other throughout the city, a bit like the audio diaries you found in the game. Do you think it is now more possible than ever, since the successful Deadpool movie, to make a dark and gritty horror-esque city like Rapture come to life on the big screen? Second question. <laughs> Wait, I'm just oh, going to okay. do all of them first, then we can answer. Okay, okay. All right. Second all right. question. Would you like a movie set in the Dark Souls universe made in Zule- New Zealand? Uh, I was going to say Zoo Neeland, which I think as of this <laughs> podcast, that entire country should change their name to. It's almost as good as Rubbish Tip. Um, by Okay, do you want uh, uh, like a movie set in the Dark Souls universe made in New Zealand by Peter Jackson or Eli Roth? Ooh. Third question, is it wrong to be gleeful about bad movies like Batman versus Superman in your opinions? Uh, and then he says, may Clitus lead the way in Dark Souls 3 with his insane ramblings. Whiskey Howl from Belgium. So, all right, let's take these one at a time. One, do you think it is now more possible than ever since a successful Deadpool movie to make a dark and gritty horror-esque city like Rapture come to life on the big screen? Nick, go. I don't think it's got anything really to do with Deadpool, but funny enough, I was actually watching um, Hellboy 2 Mm. the other day, and I I just love that movie. I mean, the first one was okay, but I thought the the second one was just fantastic. It was brilliant. And I was just watching my brother. I was thinking, like, you know what? I could really picture Guillermo del Toro making a Bioshock game. Mm-hmm. Like, I, it, but like having the, instead of it all be CGI, but like guys in rubber suits and uh, big costumes and all of that, I think it'd be fantastic. So I, I wish he would make a, a Bioshock game, to be honest. 
I don't know. I think, uh, I mean, you know, any, obviously anything is possible. I think though that you're, I think that uh, when he talks about now that there's been a Deadpool movie, can we have a Bioshock movie? I think that what we really need is we need a, um, we need a good video game movie because I don't want Bioshock to be made without the money to bring the Bioshock world to life. Right. That would be what I'd be afraid of is that a studio would be like, yeah, it's a video game movie, you know, give them, give them $4 million and just make them hire a bunch of no names and who the fuck cares. Yeah. Yeah. Now it would all be CGI anyway. I mean, like there's a reason why there hasn't been a Hellboy three, you know, recently because no one wants to do rubber suits and costumes. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think, I mean, I think that you could do that, uh, but as always allow me to take this opportunity to say again, not you know like i'm rubbing it in or anything but i still firmly believe that video games and movies are two different mediums and that people get a little bit i feel like because they're both visual mediums that people think that they're able to that you can uh kind of move back and forth between those two mediums at will whereas the thing one of the things that made bioshock so great and I'm going to I'm going to spo- I'm going to be spoilers for the first BioShock, right? So if you haven't played that, that's on you. That's not on me. That one's on you. Um <laughs> like one of the greatest things in my mind about BioShock 1 was the revelation that Atlas was uh what the fuck was the, the what is his name when he was um uh when he took off when he stopped being uh, Atlas. He was Frank Fontaine. Uh Yes. that they did a thing, and I think that this really only works one time, but it was such an effective thing where they explain where you have the interaction with Andrew Ryan, and Andrew Ryan explains that the would you kindly is a thing to make you do a thing, and that it's it's kind of an interesting like fourth wall kind of breaking thing where it's like this character has been doing a thing that happens in a bunch of video games where they ask you to go do a thing over the radio and they're like your buddy and they're doing things. But you don't even hardly notice, I feel like, the first time around that he's saying, would you kindly every time, but you still go do the things that he does because that's the path that the game leads you down. And so then it's kind of this weird twist of fate where the, the game really only has this one direction for you to go, but then they have this revelation that it's like, you've been mind controlled this entire time. And I'm just like, I really like that. And that there's there's no way, well, okay, not no way, but I feel like that revelation would be less dramatic in a movie because you could you could make it where the main character had been manipulated, and I, I, I'm not saying you have to make a Bioshock movie that's exactly the same as the game, but that to me is one of the best parts of Bioshock the game, and the reason it's so good is because you have agency in the world, because you're doing things, and that the, the game then like makes it seem like you've been controlled by this other character. Um, as far as the world of Bioshock goes, I mean, I could see a Fall of Rapture game uh, movie, you know, focusing on. Uh, you know the when rapture fell down and and kind of the things that happened there i don't know if it would be it would be a weird movie because the thing is that the fall of rapture doesn't have a happy ending <laughs> like society collapses and nobody gets away and then everybody's just monsters from now on like that's the end of the story of the fall of rapture so it's almost like you would have to write in a brand new story about like i don't know a guy and his family trying to get out as rapture is kind of coming down around them and then do they and if they do that kind of affects the whole story of bioshock right because you got somebody who successfully managed to escape or i don't know it's uh i mean they did that same kind of thing with uh dead space remember there was that um we game that had like nothing to do with the original Dead Space game. But sure, it still kind of worked. Yeah, yeah. No, I can see that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I guess I can see that. Uh, so it, it can, but I feel like still Bioshock is so far down the list that like, if they were going to make a Bioshock movie, Nick, they would probably make Infinite because it's a way easier story. Like all these racist people up in the sky, and then we got to come and rescue that girl who's been kidnapped by a giant robot, you know, like it's a way that is a way easier story for Hollywood to be like, yes, green light, boom, because it's got all the things that Hollywood likes to put in movies. It's got a a, a, a protagonist with a dark secret and a, a woman trapped in a tower that he has to rescue and a big bird robot that he has to fight and thrilling sky rail action. And, you know, 
So I feel like Bioshock, original Bioshock is a lot more, original Bioshock is a lot dirtier as far as the story for it goes. So I think it would be hard to make a movie, a good movie at least, based in it. Um, second question, would you like a movie set in the Dark Souls universe made in New Zealand by Peter Jackson or Eli Roth? Um, would you... <laughs> This one's on you, mate. <laughs> okay, I was gonna say, do you want to do you want to chime in here at all? But um, no, I do not. I don't want Dark Souls to be a movie. I want it to be a video game, um, and I want it to be a video game made by From Software. I don't want because Eli. I don't know if you know this, Nick, but Eli Roth made like a little three minute like animated thing for Dark Souls Three, and it was kind of all right, but it kind of missed a lot of the point, in my opinion, as far as what is Dark Souls about? And there's a bunch of aspects, again, of it being a video game that I feel like if you just laid out the story of Dark Souls without making people kind of piece it together or work for it and have it be ambiguous, it would be a different experience. It would just be like, you know, and then they killed all the bosses and then he killed the last boss and then he was done. So I don't know. I, I'm, I'm of the opinion I would like Hollywood to make movies that are not based on other things. I want original new stories. Like there was a thing... It was like yesterday, I was looking at my Facebook feed, and there were set pictures of Scarlett Johansson as Major Kusanagi from Ghost in the Shell. And I'm just like, oh, man, come on. Ghost in the Shell is already perfectly fine as it is. I don't need a live-action Ghost in the Shell. It didn't work for Eon Flux, and I don't see it's going to work for Ghost in the Shell. <laughs> <laughs> um, third question, is it wrong to be gleefully? is it wrong to be gleeful about bad movies like Batman versus Superman? I don't think it's wrong. To, to take joy in hating a thing as long as you're not super shitty about it. Like, just, you know, if the the main thing, Matt Frank and I have this conversation all the time, Nick, where it's like, I don't feel like it's wrong for you to like a thing, but if you're so hateful about it to people that you're actually, I don't even, I don't even know how to answer that question, that you're like, you know, if you just always, like anytime somebody's like, I like popcorn, and you're just like, I Fucking hate popcorn. Oh, God, it gets in your teeth. And it's, uh, I don't like it when it's caramel and blah, 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 blah. That You can just be a I dick about it. I feel it's kind of more appropriate for, like, the Star Wars prequels. Because, let's face it, you and I give Jason a lot of shit for <laughs> liking this movie. So I guess we're kind of gleeful about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. The thing is that I, like, I don't want to, like, I don't want to ruin... Um, I don't want to ruin somebody else's enjoyment of a thing by just shitting all over it until they just can't like it anymore. Like, I didn't care for, say, the, the last Godzilla movie, right? I didn't really care all that much for that movie. But it's not like when people are like, oh, yeah, I really like that movie. Like, what are you, stupid? Here, let me get out my 30-point list of all the shitty things that happened. I don't know. I don't know. I like to think I'm not that guy, but there are like a few movies that push my buttons, and it's like the Star Wars prequels and the uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Mm -hmm. I get really pissed off when uh, someone says they like that movie. I'm like, are you blind? What's wrong with you? Well, it also kind of depends on, I guess, what you would say is uh, kind of like what side of history you're on. Like, I, I have said multiple times, now, I don't like all of them, but I do like the first Transformers movie, the first Michael Bay Transformers movie. Like, I see that. Okay. It's got a bunch of goofy shit in it, but I, I like the, the action with the robots, and I like when they transform, and I, I enjoyed seeing it on the big screen. Now, if somebody wants to come along and be like, that movie was stupid, and I'll be like, yes, it was. And it was also a bad movie, but like, I'll, I agree with you as well. They'd be like, well, then why do you like it? Uh, I don't know. I just like watching robots punch each other, and that's about it. Like, Speed Racer. A lot of people hate the fucking Speed Racer movie. And I'm just like, I like it. And you can tell me all day long why it's a shitty movie. And I already know it's a shitty movie, but I like it anyway. <laughs> so um, let's see. Our next question comes in from I'm going to call you um, Samuel. It's not your real name. And he says, hey, Jeff and Nick, you guys are awesome. And here's my question. With Until Dawn, do you want a sequel that is a different story? Also, with the game mechanics, uh, what game would you love to be made? I could see uh, the Thing video game working with this game's mechanics. Thanks if you read this, and have a great show, uh, Samuel. I, it says, thanks if you read this. And I wanted to put in, and if you don't read this, then go to hell! Uh, <laughs> so let's see. Uh, a sequel to Until Dawn that has a, that has a different story. Uh it's not like a continuation of a story with those characters. What do you think? Yay? Nay? Mm. 
Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, they could do, like, a Halloween thing, you know, what they were originally going to do. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, with I think... Halloween 3, do you remember? It had nothing to do with the first two? Halloween 2. No, no Halloween... No, no it was Halloween, Halloween, Halloween 3. Halloween. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Season Season of the Witch, is that what it was? That's right, yeah. Or it's going to be an anthology thing? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's plenty of, of other genres of horror. Like, that one was definitely kind of Cabin in the Woods and Slasher flick, right? But, like... Um, I'm kind of tired of zombies, but you know, there's other there's other types of horror that you could do. I was actually just thinking how it would be kind of cool because one of the things, uh, and again, plug your ears if you haven't played through Until Dawn. This is not even a big thing, but whatever. Um, you know, at the very end, there's a sequence where uh, the Mister Robot guy is like freaking out. He's like hallucinating, and he's seeing all this like really just crazy. Like a big pig head comes out of the wall and shit. And I was like. I really like it when you guys do this like super surreal, creepy imagery. Like I would like maybe like to see a game that was like Nightmare on Elm Street, right? Where it's like during the day you have some of the social interaction, but then at night it's like you kind of have more of the quick time action inside of like a, a surreal dreamscape type of thing. That'd be kind of cool. No, and I'm with you there because technically that game does cover a lot of genres like with monsters and ghosts and uh, serial killers. Yeah, it's kind of all over the place. It's kind of like, you know, they, they kind of already did a lot of, a lot of that stuff. Um, yeah, it says also with the game mechanics, what game would you love to be made? Can you think of a, I mean, I like the idea that he has of a thing video game, one that is more story focused and has more of that kind of like branching choose your own adventure. In fact, that would probably really work for the Until Dawn mechanics because if it was in, you know, like the, if it was like the the thing movie where it was in a, contained area like the the ice station right then you yeah yeah i mean it it would definitely work as a game a lot better than the bloody video game did on the pc i don't know if you ever played that oh we played it for uh for the asylum last year uh we didn't get very far in it and we didn't no shit (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah i mean i think that any movie any kind of movie where people are trapped in a house you know trapped in a smaller space would probably work really well with that. Like I can actually see, you know, I'm 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 a little sick of zombies, but I could almost see something like the original Night of the Living Dead where the game was more about paranoia between the people trapped inside of the house than it is about the actual zombie outbreak. Um could work really well with the uh, until dawn mechanics. Um, Maybe dog soldiers. <laughs> yeah, or ginger yeah. snaps. Yeah, there we yeah. go. <laughs> um yeah. Oh, I'm just looking at a, a, a list of horror movies here. The Shining. That'd be a really interesting. That'd be a really interesting uh, take on that. If you were, you know, like three characters, right? And it's just you running away from a crazy dude who's trying to chop you up because he's he's gone nuts. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I think. I mean, you know, to be honest, uh, Samuel, that the, that style that Until Dawn is has already it was already established as it was kind of what. Quantic Dream did right with Fahrenheit and and Indigo Pro, or uh, 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 what was the one where the kids calling for his kid Heavy Rain. Heavy- <laughs> I love the fact you have to say like the the father calling is like Sean Sean. <laughs> Everyone knows what you're talking about already. Actually, his kid's name is Jason. I know that because uh, oh, sorry, Jason. Someday I'm going to have Jason Murphy like by himself play just that one sequence of heavy rain where it's just jason, press x jason. to jason yeah um so i mean i and i feel like even the telltale walking dead games he a lot in that same direction what i think until dawn does really well is that you know like the beginning of that game drags on a little bit but i like it once things start heating up and they start kind of getting crazy i also really think that the way that they they concentrated on those those really like really nice graphics and kind of rotoscoped uh, like versions of people worked pretty well. There was, there was a lot of until dawn that probably could have been cut out. Like if I had my druthers, I probably would have made the beginning of the game last for like 15 minutes, maybe 20. Like really speed that beginning part up and get to the, get to, to the stuff because there was a lot of like, do you think that Sheila is a bitch? Uh, yes or no and it's just like dude i don't care fucking let's get to the let's get to the murder time was that the uh asian actress you're talking about there 
Oh, yes. Uh, I don't know what her name was in the game. Emily. Yeah. I know. I do remember it now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. When, when they go to the to the cable car tower, that could have been cut. There was nothing of value in that scene. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to applaud them that there was a real, you know, they had a real twist, a real twist in that game that I didn't see coming. Like, I thought it was going to be a slasher game. And then, like, you know, uh, Brian Salisbury and I were playing through it. And I was just like, oh, shit. Oh, this is Okay all right, I got you now. Like they, and they, they stuck to the slasher bit long enough to, to lull me into a false sense of security. And that was great. So, uh, let's see. Our next question comes in from Bo, the Buddha who says, dear worshipers of Don and uh, it's been a while since I've written you guys a question because of the sci-fi books that Jeff had recommended on the previous podcast. Plus my torrenting romp through dark souls three. But now I am back with the following question. So I've been saving up for money for two games, Dark Souls 3 and the new Doom. With the third installment in the series, I am more than satisfied, but I recently had a conversation with two of my friends about the upcoming Doom. We compared it to Doom 3, and we came to the conclusion that we seem to prefer the scarier and more claustrophobic approach that we had in 3. It was frightening. It was a frightening experience where zombies uh, would come at you in the dark. Uh, and in the reboot, the trailers are all about action and face planting monsters into the ground and your muscular space marine fists. I understand that Bethesda is trying to bring Doom back to its roots, but wouldn't it be better if it re- uh, retained that horror factor like the previous iteration? Would love to hear your opinion on this. Uh, thank you uh, for the am- amazing nonstop content and awesome commentary on all things gaming and life in general. Much love from your friend, Balkan resident, Bo the Buddha. And he says, P.S. Also, quick question concerning Dark Souls 3. Jeff, how do you handle the secret boss at the beginning of the game where it says turn back? Really curious. Thanks in advance. Almighty Dark Souls master. I will just take that P.S. question real fast and say you just have to hit it a bunch with uh, your if weapon a uh, lot in two hands and dodge whenever it does a thing. And don't use magic because magic is garbage on that that guy. So, uh. <laughs> all right. Um, okay. I don't know. I don't know what version of Doom Three he was playing because I remember you you got me to uh, review it back on Spill dot com. It was like the the BFG edition or something like that. Uh huh. Yeah, there was nothing scary about that game whatsoever. I I, I don't think I had a particularly fun time playing it, and I blamed a lot of it on you. <laughs> a lot of Skype calls like why are you getting me to play this game it's shite you've got to play it you've got to play it no I uh, um, I could definitely see that uh, it's you know the, I think the problem with Doom 3 as a as a scary game is that it's um, uh, the thing about the game is that there were some, su- there was a surprising, there was some surprising parts to it, but I felt like the, the, it wasn't so much scary as it was irritating <laughs> that like the things that were coming at you, once you, once you saw them, you could shoot them and they would die. It was more just a problem of the whole, like, well, you've got to switch out your flashlight for your gun and then go back to flashlight and then go back to gun. I don't know. I didn't, I'm with you that I didn't really find it uh, very scary, but then I have, I don't get scared as much by games. And that's not like a, that's not like a, Oh, look how fucking big my dick is. Like it's like that. I get so invested in the mechanics of a game that a lot of times the things that are meant to elicit emotional responses um, don't do it as much. Like I actually get more scared in games like dark souls of enemies because when the, when the mechanics of the game have been like established and a character hits you once, like let's say that you're playing a game, Nick, right? You come around the corner and there's like three bad guys there. And the first one walks up to you and you start fighting it and it hits you one time and it takes off all, almost all of your health. And you're just like, Oh shit. And there are three of these guys. And then like the second one stands up and starts walking towards you. And just like, what the, Oh fuck. Like run away, run away, run away. I don't know what to do here. Like that's where I get more emotional in games is, uh, when the game uses the mechanics to be scary Outside of like, woogity, 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 woo, you know, like <laughs> jumping out yeah, of a I can't closet. The last, I can't remember the last game I was really scared playing. That's mm. the thing. I mean, like even Alien Isolation, like it's uh, like the the niche part of it disappeared when you figured out that you could like just sneak behind the alien 
Yep. <laughs> the whole time. Well, plus the problem with Alien Isolation, or at least the problem that I had with it, was the fact that because there was no – because you literally had no defense against the alien, it was like, all right, so I'm just going to do this until I figure out the, the right speed run path around where the alien is. Because I can't, I can't fight the alien. All I can do is run away. Like to me, it's scarier when you're fighting something that's really difficult um, than it is if you're fighting something or you're interacting with something that is invincible. Like you know, it's invincible. There's nothing you can do to destroy this thing. Um, I don't know. So it's kind of, kind of back and forth. But I don't know. I, I see. Bo the Buddha, I think you're asking the wrong person because to me, I grew up with Doom 1, Doom 2, Quake, you know, those id games. So Doom 3 to me was a real departure from what I consider to kind of be like the soul of those classic titles. Um, I'm really in it more for the action. So I mean, maybe maybe split the – like I think that they were kind of trying to split the franchise at one point where like Quake from now on was going to be like the action one and then Doom was going to be a little bit more – Scary pants, but I don't know. I think the Shambler in Quake scared me more than anything than Doom in Doom ever did. <laughs> the first time I saw a Shambler, and I was just like, ah, what the fuck? Get out of here. But So needless to say, Nick, you were not scared at no, all. Just, just annoyed <laughs> at you. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> the longer we talk about this, the more. I'm done. Fuck you, Jeff. <laughs> All right, this next four years. Let's move on. (laughs) Should we talk about uh, Should we talk about Rage next, Nick? Should we talk about Oh uh... fuck no, please! (laughs) The other id game that I know that you're a huge fan of. Oh my god! All right, I just went into. uh, I'm sorry. This is a really brief aside before we move on to the next question. I just went to Google Image Search and I typed in the words Shambler space Quake because I kind of I just wanted to see what a Shambler and Quake looked like again because I think they're I think they're real. um, nifty looking kind of just you know evil looking motherfuckers and I scroll down and like four lines down is a picture of what can only be described as a shambler wearing with giant boobs wearing a metal bikini and I'm like why why <laughs> that's I mean don't get me wrong that's more frightening than the shambler was in the original quake for to come lumbering towards me with giant boobs like I don't know the Russian out of the Punisher comics. Anyway, um, next question comes in from Julio. Julio says, hey, Jeff and Nick, um, I've been recently playing a... Oh, okay. Mm. Hey, Jeff and Nick, I've been playing... I've been recently playing a whole lot of games based on real-life locations. Yakuza 4 and 5, Sleeping Dogs, Infamous Second Son, GTA 5, Life is Strange, and L.A. Noir. And I've been thinking to myself, what real-life locations do I want to see from games? I personally think that setting a game in a real place, excuse me, uh, could actually immerse the player even more than just setting it in Generic City 105. Uh, so, Masters of Dong, I ask you, what location do you want to see out of a game, and what type of game do you want to see in that location? You could have an open world uh, crime game set in Mexico City, a superhero game like Infamous set in Austin, Texas, a choose your own adventure game set in Beverly Hills, California, or a hack and slash game like God of War set in feudal Japan. Thanks for answering. Julio, I think I already know your answer, Nick. I want to, I want to hear your answer, but I think I already know what it is. What is it? I think I already know what it is. Get you uh, you want to see the, the Getaway 3 set in London. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, you know me so well. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, hey, you know what? Like, I'm all I'm, – I'm, I'm, I wish that they would do more in other places because it seems like half of the open world games that we get are set in New York, right? Um, or generic city that might as well be New York. I mean, I guess what Watch Dogs was in Chicago, right? Was it yeah, Chicago? Yeah. Um, I would like to see some stuff that was a little bit different. Like, you know, what would be really cool is um, I know there have been a few games already that have done this, but like a if they made like a GTA style game uh, that was fully and completely set in uh, Vegas in Las Vegas. Because Las Vegas is a hell of a, a visual place, right? With all the casinos and stuff. Yeah, you only got a taste of it in San Andreas. But uh, yeah, absolutely. A Vegas one would be great. Yeah, especially a crime one. You got all the desert outside. 
Um, I've been saying for a long time that uh, I would love to see a game set in Austin um, because I think Austin is a... Why? Yeah. Uh, I think Austin's got a lot of character to it. I mean, you know, I'm I'm probably slight... What kind of game, though? Oh, what kind of game? Um, I don't even care. You take your pick. Crime. Life is Strange sort of game? Sure. (laughs) You make a... Yeah. Hipster teenager. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Going food. to Rudy's barbecue and moaning about uh, how they don't serve enough coffee in a, in a little cafe down the street. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I totally I totally get on board with that. Hipster hipster choose your own adventure set in Austin, Texas, it would absolutely be perfect to be like, oh man, my favorite food truck had to move locations because those bastards at the city <laughs> Sold the land off to a business, you corporate stooges, and then I'm going to turn back time. Brrr, ah, my coffee place is back. My my new food truck is come back. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know any other places that you think would be interesting. Um, I don't know. Maybe like a game set in more exotic places, like um, like like in India, for example. I thought that that would be kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or you know places yeah that were not just the same two, the same two cities in the United States. <laughs> oh yeah, where there's like always L.A. or or New York City, I suppose. I, yeah. I could I could go for some Midwest bullshit, right? Like just some, I don't know, Arizona. Oh, you know, like painted. I was about cliffs. to say that Arizona. Yeah, yeah. Like where um, where's Walter White from? Oh, Albuquerque. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. New Mexico. Yeah, yeah I could totally go kind of, for some New Mexico. Yeah, um, kind of sick. I would love it if the next Grand Theft Auto was Vice City 2, set it's down in Vice Miami. City. I I can't, I can't believe that it's not going to be Vice City. It's definitely not going to be GTA London, that's for sure. Oh, that would be cool, though. That would be great. Uh, would you mind playing it in the 60s? That's what the first one was set. Fuck no, dude. The only problem... Okay, so back when I played The Getaway, you and I have talked about this. I had a serious problem driving on the wrong side of the road, but uh, Sleeping Dogs showed me that I could get used to that shit eventually because... I tend to drive into oncoming traffic anyway, so fuck it. It's, it should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, you know, Spec Ops The Line was set in like a kind of a post-apocalyptic uh, Dubai. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Dubai would be pretty cool. There's a lot of really interesting stuff there. Like every, You know, just take all the stuff. You know, I, I feel like movies have like the same five places that they set everything to, right? You've got Dubai. You've got uh, Rio de Janeiro, like in Max Payne 3. Um you know, obviously New York. I, you know, it's just actually when I read this question, I was thinking like I'd love to play a sequence in a video game that takes place at Mount Rushmore. Like uh, fucking what's that Hitchcock movie where he's climbing on the on Rushmore oh, at the end? It's North by Northwest. Is it North is by it? Northwest? Yeah, yeah. Um, or what's that? Uh, um, I don't know. You know what? I I say just take a t- get a location that has not already been made six hundred times before. I would be happy. And put in literally any game there. Hmm. Uh, all right, next up, this one comes in from Jason. Jason says, good morning, afternoon, evening, wonderful hosts. Uh, just a few months ago, due to the universal pra- praise, I decided to take a run at the Witcher franchise. Being the completionist that I am, I felt there was no other option uh, than to start uh, uh, as to where to begin besides the first game. Yeah. I did finish it, and I enjoyed it overall, but it was painfully obvious how dated the game was. Yeah, you, you shouldn't have done that. I should really start with the second one. <laughs> From the immense amount of backtracking without a very functional fast travel system and relatively poor tutorials, the game was really showing its age, and it's released in 2007. My question is this. When going back and playing games from the semi-distant to distant past, what do you tend to notice the most between the way games were made then as compared to how they're made now? Let's leave out graphical fidelity as the too obvious answer. Do you miss some of the old tenets of game design, or are you thankful for things that are done much better now than in the days of yore? Thanks for answering my question, Jason. I, oh, that's a good question. Um, I think pacing mm-hmm. is going to be an answer. Because like, uh, uh, like I love the Mass Effect trilogy, and I play them over and over again. My least favorite one is the first one, simply because how long it takes to get to places and those uh, elevator rides, certainly don't hold up very well. Right, right. Yeah. Whereas you play Mass Effect 2, and it's immediately, like, leagues better than the first one. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only thing that I I miss, kind of, in a way, the first one, is that you could actually land on planets and kind of walk around. But there's nothing that you could especially do in the 
in the first place. So, yeah. Yeah, it's been a lot of times I played it, but I seem to remember them being mostly empty. Um, yeah. Yeah. There was a, a few things like, you know, you drive up the side of a mountain and there'd be like a chest or something up there and there'd be like a little encounter that you could do here and there. But that for the most part, like it seems like they would have like it would have they would have been better served by having fewer planets that you could land on that all had more uh, uh, development done to them, which is what they did in the second game. Right, right. Um Hmm. You know, it's funny. I one of the there's two things that I notice a lot of times in older games. Um, one of them is I feel like as games go on, and this seems like a probably a really weird thing, but um, just the like UI layout, just the way that games are laid out and HUDs taking up less and less of the screen and things like that. I really like the the way that I mean, like you look at the Grand Theft Auto franchise and how they like in GTA Five how they they uh, contracted all the information that you need in that one little box in the bottom corner, right? And for a game that has a lot of information, it was like, here is everything that you need right in one little place. Um, also, I'm a real big fan of uh, the work that's been done over the years with checkpointing. Uh, is there's plenty of old games where it's like, oh, God, yeah, you're right. <sighs> hey, did you save? You just lost two hours of game. Ha-ha! Now you get to play through the exact same sequence for another, for two hours, which... You know, some games that works in, but a lot of games you're like, dude, I just fucking blew all that shit up. Like, <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> um, and it'll be worse if, like, uh, if there's a bug in the thing and you have to go past the checkpoint to, like, way before to start all over again. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Also, I could definitely say that uh, both music and voice acting have gotten a lot better over time. Um, like there were plenty of games that had relatively decent music and relatively decent voice acting, but like, it seems, um, it seems like a thing that I don't even have, like, I haven't had a game to complain about the music or voice acting on (laughs) in forever. Right. No lines like you could have been a Jill sandwich. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, it's funny because that's the, that's like the line that immediately springs to mind. But like, that is, um, that's such a memorable line. What does he say? It's like, blood looks like Chris's blood. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be examining this. I'm like, how, what, why do you need to examine it? Like, it's just blood on the fucking floor, mate. I'll give this to you, Jill, the master of unlocking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I love it. You know, I really wish, like, I, 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 I think that it would be great. Like, I love the way that Until Dawn, maybe this goes back to that previous guy's question. I love the way that Until Dawn was like a 90s horror movie. I want somebody to make like a pitch perfect 80s action movie with bad acting in it, right? Like something where it's just horrible, horrible and and full on 80s uh craziness. That's That's what Duke Nukem should have been. I'm really annoyed with that. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody yeah. asked me like uh we were doing a live stream and somebody was asked uh what do you think is a thing that they could announce at E3 that would just blow your mind? And I was like, I probably a new Duke Nukem game. They're just like, and there's a new one. And then they show a trailer and I'm like, oh shit, that looks really good. What the fuck? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, oh, here's another one, I guess. Um, you know, I tell you what, it used to be that I really think that the gaming industry has done an amazing job of, um, the controller support, the uh, specifically Microsoft's, it's I forget what it's called, Xbox um, development kit or something like that, where uh, the PC now seems to flawlessly accept Xbox 360 controllers, right? You just plug an Xbox 360 controller in, if it's a wired one, and then all of the buttons are changed, so that they're the A and the X and the B and the Y buttons and left trigger and right trigger and stuff like that. I mean, it used to be just a real pain in the ass if you wanted to use anything besides a mouse and a keyboard on a PC game. Um, on the other hand, I feel like, I don't know. Nick, I was reading a bunch of the Dark Souls 3 re- user reviews on Metacritic, and there are a bunch of people on the PC release that are just like, I should be able to play this game with a mouse and a keyboard 0 out of 10. Fuck you. I returned it. It's like, uh, okay. All right. All right. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's see. The next one here comes in from Brandon, who says, Hello, prophets of the one true dong. Brandon here with one of them questions you crave so badly. What is your favorite game to play with friends? 
Also, is there a game that your friends are good at that you constantly lose at? Uh, mine is any Mario game, which as a Souls player can be kind of annoying. Thanks for all the hard work, loyal patron Brandon. Oh, he asked if he can buy a Loco Steve shirt. I don't have any Loco Steve shirts, Brandon. I might have like one that's mine, but I'm not going to sell you my Loco Steve shirt. Sorry. Um, what do you think, Nick? Is, what's your favorite game? What's, do you play games with other people that often? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I play uh, GTA Online with my brother. And his oh, really? Friends. Yeah. I, quite, I, I mean, I find it a lot of fun. I'm not particularly very good at it because I don't have time to... Uh, excel at it, but it, 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 it's a lot of fun. I mean, most of the time we just kind of dick around. Like, we try to take that perfect selfie picture in the game. So, like, uh, one of us will... We have some really complicated plan of, like, okay, so you're going to drop me off on top of the skyscraper, okay, and then you're going to fly away with a helicopter, and then you're going to get a plane, and then you're going to crash into me, and I'm going to take a selfie at the exact moment when you're about to crash into me on top of that skyscraper. <laughs> just so... I want to I see how close you can be so I could actually see your face in the the windscreen on the plane. <laughs> wow, that's great. Do you do you post those online? You should post those uh, online. You should capture them, man. You should go get. I, to... I, do, I have it on my uh, PlayStation somewhere. It's such a, it's the dumbest idea we've ever had. Or or the other one is like um, a selfie where he is skydiving, you know, and he's about to hit me on the ground or something like that. <laughs> so he looks like super. <laughs> So we're not actually we're not playing the game properly in this sense. Yeah. Um I mean I got to say that my favorite co-op is uh, this is you know shock and awe, right? Is probably the Souls games playing them with other people. Um I do though really enjoy a good like couch co-op game. Like uh when Hell Divers was kind of a thing last year. Hell Divers was really fun to play with other people. Or like any time that we have a game for the dojo when I can play couch co-op with other people. Um, I really like, uh, I also really like fighting games and I, I love playing fighting games with my friends who are in the room and not with like, you know, insane people online who are good at games and shit. Right. Like <laughs> I don't want to play against them. I want to get play with somebody who's as crappy as I am so that we can play, you know, so that we can have a, a fun time and not just get, uh, get my ass handed to me all over the place um i'm actually trying to find some of the couch cock games i don't actually do a whole hell of a lot of co-op games with my friends i don't know i don't know guess there needs to be more of those i don't know you got any, you got anything else besides gta online nick um no i mean it's just that's not a game it's like that and red dead redemption um army of two which oh, was yeah. fun but, yeah, oh yeah that's a good one yeah, I played all the way through that with a friend of mine. It was good. Even though I fucking hate split screen, I still was like, yeah, this is the way to play this game. I quite like split screen. I mean, I, technically, I kind of prefer it. Uh, yeah, I, that and uh, Killzone 3, I enjoyed immensely. Okay. You play that with another person? Yeah, you can. Oh, it's been a long time. The whole, the whole single player game. Oh, right. Is that the one that has that asshole dude in it? And like the other person plays as the asshole dude? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I don't remember shit about Killzone. <laughs> uh, You're not really supposed to. I have a guilty sort of pleasure about Killzone. I guess it's because I like shooting space Nazis. Okay. Yeah. Nothing wrong with shooting a few space Nazis. Do you think yeah. that they'll ever make another one? Do you think they'll make an, um, another Killzone? Uh, uh, yes, I do. Will it be good? I'm not so sure because they kind of wrapped everything up after the Killzone 3. Because, like, at the end of that game, you just nuke the entire planet. I'm like, okay, so there's no more space Nazis no, Nazis left. Did you see so you... Oh, go ahead. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, in Shadowfall, it's, like, the worst case of international policy I've ever seen in a game. It's like, oh, we felt really sorry for the space Nazis, despite, despite the fact they tried to nuke us. So we're going to give them half the plan. We're like, no, 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 that, that, that would never happen. I refuse to believe something that retarded would happen. Of course, that's what the rest of the game happens. You, you, they get pissed off with you. Yep, yep, absolutely. I don't know. I kind of, I, it, yeah, you're right that that part was real dumb. Uh, but, you know, I kind of enjoyed Killzone Shadowfall. Like, as a launch title on the PlayStation 4, like, it looked really good. And um, the story was a little shallow and kind of stupid. But, yeah, you know, um, the action was decent. Uh, the multiplayer wasn't that bad, and I kind of like to have the little what is it, the owl? I guess the little thing that would fly around with you, do different things. 
I know, mate, but it'd be kind of like you defeated the Nazis in World War II, and then you feel sorry for them, so you give them half of America. Yeah, no, that doesn't. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm not going to tell you. Well, but but wait a minute. Was that the planet that Killzone Shadowfall was on? Was that the planet, the the Helgen homeworld? No, it wasn't. The, Hel- uh, the Helgen homeworld was destroyed. So they give them half of uh, Vector, which is the allied, the, the, the good guys' homeworld. Oh, yeah, that doesn't make any sense, does it? I just, <laughs> no, it doesn't. Sorry, the story of, of Killzone, just like it goes in one ear and then just drips out the other one, and I can't keep it in my mind. But, yeah, half of Vecta, that's kind of, that's kind of stupid. Um, yeah, I understand if it was like a slum, like it was District 9. Yeah. Then maybe that might be interesting. And maybe it would be cool if you played as the, the Helgen bad guys. Yeah. That yeah. would be pretty interesting. That would have been interesting. That would have been an interesting, an interesting twist of the whole thing. Is like now you're, yeah, because yeah, that would have, yeah. I mean, you could have made people feel sorry for the Helgens, especially when you say that, like, what? Uh, it's uh, thirty years after Killzone Three, so like, you know, yeah, you could, you could kind of set it up for a new thing where you go, just like, look how shitty the ISA treats us all the time, and all we want is food, and they keep saying no food for you, and. You know, blah 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 blah, and 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 new filters for our gas masks that we have to wear all the goddamn time because yeah. we're Helgen. <clears throat> um, all right, next up, this one comes from JD, who says, "Hey Jeff and Nick, I bought an N64 recently for nostalgia's sake, and I've been able to replay one of my favorite games for the system, Mischief Makers." I bought it as a kid, and it's really stuck with me all these years. Sadly, I haven't met many other people who even know the game exists, and it kind of bums me out. I feel like there's a lot of obscure games out there that, for one reason or another, end up being one of someone's favorite games of all time. Do you have a personal favorite game that you'd consider a hidden gem and wish that more people knew about it? Uh, Thanks for the daily laughs. It makes my work much easier. J.D. This is a big one, Nick. What do you think? You got any? You go, you, you go first. I got a bunch. I actually, I, I took a moment before we started, and oh, good for you! I had to like think off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I would, I would say there's a there's a few that I always talk about. Um, like I talk about Singularity all the time. I fucking love that game. Like I think that it's a really solid, underappreciated game. Um, I've talked before about how I feel like um like these are these are more recent examples, right? But uh I feel like Binary Domain was a game that got probably more shit on it than it probably should have, in my opinion. Like I actually thought that by the end of the game, Binary Domain had some kind of interesting points to make about, you know, the what is humanity and machines and blah 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 blah. Um I've said multiple times on the show, there's a couple old games. Hostile Waters and Teus Rising is this old game that I really love. Um, I haven't played it in a while, so if you guys go and get it's on Steam now and good old games, but if you go play it and it turns out to just be the total and complete and garbage, uh, sorry, but I just remember playing it and being like, fucking A. Because, like, a bunch of, uh, like, I remember, like, Tom Baker is one of the voice actors in that game, and it's got a pretty cool story. The story is written by Warren Ellis, the guy that wrote Transmetropolitan and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and along those same lines, there's a really old game by the company Looking Glass called Terra Nova Strike Force Centauri that was, um, <clears throat> uh, I always felt like it was an underrated game that people just didn't get a chance to play it. Now, I haven't gone back and played that one, but that's a, a real kind of interesting little title that I really liked. Um, also along those same lines, what was I? Oh fuck. There was another one that was just in my brain and then it just fell. Mm. No, but the one that the new one that I was going to talk about that I haven't really ever talked about as much on the show before is, um, and Nick, you might, you might remember this. Do you remember a game? I believe this was a PlayStation two game. Um, <laughs> that was called, psyops the mind gate conspiracy oh that sounds really familiar um it was one of two different like psychic video games that came out i think the other one might have been made by the people who made like time splitters or something like that but it was a it was a kind of like a third person action game about a covert ops guy who has psychic powers who's going in to to 
to take down this group that's also got psychic powers and um yeah i just i remember playing that game and just kind of enjoying the ever loving crap out of it and i don't know that it really gets brought up as much oh there's a windows version i wonder if it's on steam you can play that mm. <laughs> i don't know what do you uh, think i don't think i never no i never played that game i mean i think <sighs> i was i was thinking about that game uh the punisher the the from 2004 I love that game. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. And I never understood why they never made another one, which was as balls out, balls to the wall action and sadistic as that one was. Mm -hmm. I I was just thinking about the other day when I was watching uh, Daredevil season two on Netflix. Yes. I actually went out and, uh, and found a copy of that game and, and loaded it up uh, because I thought we might do it for like a stream or something. Um, because yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you on that one. I feel like it's, it's, uh, it's a real, real underrated, real underrated game. Mm-hmm. Um, I tell you what else have you ever played? Do you remember? Hmm. This is one that's been stuck in my head for a while and I got to find a place for it somewhere, Nick, somewhere I got to find a loving place on rage select. Do you remember? No one lives forever. Remember that game? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, remind me, which game is that? Uh, like a 60s spy game with a lady, yes! Kate Archer. Yes, that game was fucking awesome. I love that game. Yeah, it was. The first one was good, and the second one was, like, even better. The second one had all of these, like, upgrades and these kind of, like, just, like, cheesy villains and mod. And you got this lady, and she's just like, yeah, I'm Kate Archer. Fuck you guys. Um, and it was it was. It was a great game. Like, it was fun and colorful and, you know, cheeky dialogue and, like, villains that were silly, but, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then you go and like, you flip a coin and distract somebody and then stab them with a katana or shoot them with a laser or something. Uh, Yeah, I feel like that game just does not get... It just doesn't get... like. And then they made... It's like they made two of them and they were both very well loved and then they made Contract Jack, which was horrible, and then done. And then it was just like, oh, it's over. Fucking nobody gives a shit anymore. The dream is <laughs> over. Yeah. It's time to grow up. Yep. Who, who owns that? Who owns the property for No One Lives Forever? Let's see. The publisher was Fox Interactive. Hmm. Yeah, I'd really love to see another one of those. I mean, just, you know, like, I got to say, I know that we're not – you know, there hasn't been a new Austin Powers movie in a long time, but like the colorful super spy swing in 60s seems like the perfect place to set a whole bunch of video games. Oh, man. OK, I'd love to see Rockstar make a game set in that time. Is that what that GTA game was? Is that what the London 1969 yeah, yeah. game was like that? I'd love to yeah. see them make one that was like, you know, like on the new consoles with all the fancy, fancy bubbles and graphics and shit like that. Like that would be that'd be so fun. It's just a good, fun, silly, yeah, kind of video game. <laughs> the music would be really good in that game. Absolutely. Yep. No, oh, that would be great. But yeah, if you've never played No One Lives Forever, like I don't here. Let me take a look real fast. I don't even think you can get. I think you have to like order. I, in fact, I did order a copy of two at one point, just in case, just in case we ever wanted to look at it. But I don't think. Um, yeah, I don't think that you can get it. I don't think you can get it on good old games. You can get it on Steam even. I think that you have to like order it off of um uh order it Amazon. off of Amazon. Yeah. And I bet I'm curious to know if it's one of those things that's like insanely expensive if you order it off of Amazon. Let me see here. No one lives forever. Um Woo. Not holy shit. Uh okay, let's see. Yeah, it looks like, I mean, for the PC versions, it looks like Amazon says $48.59 for No One Lives Forever 2, uh, $49.98 for No One Lives Forever 1, and wow. the Game of the Year edition for No One Lives Forever 1, $99? <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> wow. Well, I got to tell you, if you could borrow it from your friend, that would be cool. I don't I mean like here's the thing. Um I will tell you guys right now that No One Lives Forever 2 looks really good on the looks pretty decent on the PC and there actually is a um uh, a widescreen patch you can get for it that makes it 
work correctly in 16 by 9 instead of 4 by 3. I wish I still had my copy. God damn it. I think I still have the first. Actually, no, I think I have both of them. So I don't know. One of these days, maybe we'll have to go out and uh, um, and figure out a way to 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 do something with those. The thing is that I, I like, I'd love to do a sequential for no one lives forever too, but it's actually long. It's a long game. Like it's not eight hours. It's more like, like uh 12 to 14 hours. Um, so I don't know. It's one of those things where I don't know if I want to devote like every, like every Saturday on rage, like to a game that hardly anybody even knows about it anymore. But, um, all right. So I hope that is, do you have any, did you think of anything else? No, nothing else. Or did no one lose forever? Just, just make everything go out, fall out of your brain too. Yeah, it did. Uh, eighteen. Yeah, here, this one. This uh, this. How long to beat is the website that I go to to see how long games are. This is the main story of No One Lives Forever. One is thirteen hours. That's that's pretty good for a single player game. Yeah, they wouldn't do that anymore today. No. Um, all right, one more question. This one comes in from, I'm going to call you Snuggly, uh, who says, Hey, guys, I want to get into Let's Plays, but I found it really hard to find topics to talk about. How do you constantly find topics to talk about, especially when you're by yourself? Thanks, uh, Snuggly the Crow. Uh, I, I Actually, I, I could use your opinion as well, so you go ahead. I'm not for Let's Plays, but... For talking consistently by yourself, um, without a script. Mm, let's say that I've had a lot of practice at it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, like when I was uh, when I was in middle school, I was in journalism, and they gave me this. We they made up these awards, and they gave me this award that was the most able to talk to anybody or nobody and enjoy it award. Um, I don't know. I'm just a yappy, I'm a yappy motherfucker. Actually, it's weird because, like, I'm pretty yappy here and I'm pretty yappy during Let's Plays. But, like, you know, let's say that I went up to, like, a woman at a bar and I'd be like, hi, what do you, do you like, do you like, do you like stuff? I like, I like stuff, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, okay, so here's the thing. I could say that uh, if you're doing Let's Plays, uh, the best way to keep talking during a let's play is to find a game that doesn't have a lot of dead space. Uh, you're looking for something where the action is pretty consistent. So there's always something to talk about. And you're also looking for something that doesn't have like huge stretches of story, like a JRPG that has just like big, long dialogues of things. Not to say that you can't, but just to say, it's easier. Like, take something, for example, like... Um, Metal Gear Solid. Does that be impossible to do? Metal Gear Solid is... Yeah, John and I, had we already... We played through that for Patreon. But I'm thinking, like, of a good example would be something like maybe... Um, uh, like, t uh, uh, Uncharted 2 would be a good example, right? Because you got a good mix of, like, action and then some cool cutscenes and then some more action and some cool cutscenes. So if you don't... If you're not able to just yap about nothing, then if you're looking to do Let's Plays, like find something that's consistently going to be giving you something to talk about. Um, Bayonetta, right? Bayonetta is either going to be action or it's going to be cut scenes with Bayonetta being all, I'm a librarian, you know, or, or Bullet Storm or, you know, something like something with some action that keeps rolling along. Um, for my money, when I run out of stuff to say, I usually just think about things that are t slightly tangentially related to the things that I say. So start with one thing and then move slowly in one direction. But I don't know. Just walk down the street and practice. That'll you won't give you any weird looks or anything. Like nobody'll look at you strange. <laughs> just walk down the road and you're just like, I'm talking about things, things, I love things. Or, you know, if you have a hard time with it and you're planning on doing a Let's Play, maybe sit down and uh, and just think about it before you start your Let's Play. Just be like, I'm going to think of four or five things that I can write down that if I run out of things to say about the game, that I could just be like, all right, now before we continue, let me tell you about hot dogs. My favorite hot dogs are the kind with cheese in the middle. I would, yeah, I would say that's a good one, like to practice, you know, just like record yourself and then listen back to it and then uh, figure out how you want to change the 
the tone of your voice if you're speaking too slowly, if you're speaking too quickly, and then the words are being lost. So definitely practice before doing it. However, I don't do Let's Play, so I don't know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> You do scripted things, which it's pretty easy to know what you're going to say during those. You've already written it down on a piece of paper. Exactly. Yes, yes. And I do my recordings like one sentence at a time. So. <laughs> yeah. I can also say that I don't do a lot of... I don't do a lot of solo things by myself. Even when I do, I mean, every video that we do has a co-host and that's the entire reason is so you have somebody to talk to. Um, but even when I do, like I do a midnight launch and I'm by myself, it's just me and the game. I still have the Twitch chat. Like if you go back and listen to the midnight madness I did for dark souls three, like I was addressing the Twitch chat the entire time. Like they would, whenever I had a moment, a lull, they would ask me a question and I would answer it. I'd be like, and so so and so from the chat says blah 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 blah. Um, and then the only other one that I've ever done where I was by myself was um, uh, Jeff versus Beer, and that was just because I was fucking wasted. So it was just like, hey, let me tell you another thing, Jimmy, about when I was a kid. <laughs> fucking <laughs> Beer used to come out of every. You didn't even. I don't know what Molly is. But that's a drug, but I don't understand it. And just you want to guys go get some tacos. You know what my favorite taco is? I like the tacos. It, oh man, that sounds like a bad idea to do drunk twitching. Do you know when you cut up the hot dogs and you put them into macaroni? That's what I want right now is the macaroni hot dog. Who invented macaroni hot dog, do you think? Was it just like a mom who was like, shut up, have macaroni. And the kids were like, but I want hot dogs. You know, that kind of thing. Um, sorry, I, that was what Jeff versus beer was like because it was just me and nothing. Me and I would literally, Nick, I would literally sit down and drink an entire six-pack in about 45 minutes and then hit the record button and just be like, bah! <laughs> was it even recording was what I was going to ask. <laughs> no, like, don't need it... to worry about you, mate. <laughs> it was like, oh, shit, I didn't even press record. Fuck. <laughs> I don't do it anymore because the last time that I was trying to do it, I did two in a row. And the next day I woke up and I looked at them and I was like, neither of these is usable. I'm not putting this shit on the Internet. This is incomprehensible. <laughs> so... Uh, and guess what? That is all the questions that we have. Uh, we're done. So another podcast down. Uh, Nick, why don't you tell the fine people less about macaroni with cut? Did, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Before we continue, did did they do that in Britain? To do that in Britain, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yes, uh, we don't do combinations of such food, but we do have macaroni. No, what I'm talking about is like there's a thing here where it's like. You make the macaroni and then you boil a hot dog and cut the hot dog up into little slices, then put it in the macaroni. And then you got macaroni with a hot dog in it. Have you ever? Have you uh, ever... No, no, but I wouldn't be surprised if someone was doing it. And like, I, I get annoyed when I see people putting uh, potato chips between sandwiches or uh, deep frying uh, chocolate bars. Uh huh. Like they, like they do in Scott. Wait, hold like on. I just, I... Hold on, yeah. hold on, uh, hold on. I was just typing. I wanted to see a picture of macaroni with little hot dogs cut up in it because, okay, listen, that's like a thing in America that I don't know why. Like I don't know who it was that thought about that, but I was I was typing uh, macaroni with hot dogs online, and somebody I like Google auto corrected me to macaroni with hot dogs recipe. I'm like, what fucking recipe? You make one thing of Kraft macaroni and cheese, and then you boil a hot dog and cut it up and and put it on top of that. And that's the entirety of macaroni with a hot dog cut up on top of it. Anyway, I'm sorry. Sh share your best macaroni and the hot dog uh, story in the comments section below. <laughs> so that Enough so that you need a recipe to go with it. Yes, yes. I saw a video the other day on... Uh, <laughs> I don't know if this was part of another video and I just didn't see the rest of it. Somebody posted on my Facebook feed. There was a guy giving a tutorial about how to open up a, a gate. Like just, to, you know, like you're out in the world and there's like a, a, a metal gate that you have to open up. And it was a tutorial about, okay, so don't ever push, always pull. Because if you're, if you're on the wrong side of it and you pull it, then you're still walking forward and your body will then push it forward. Uh, whereas if you're on the right side of it. And it was just like, do people need a video? to tell them how to 
pull or what way to put okay never mind jeff i remember there used to be a youtube channel where it'd be like uh picking stuff up so it'd be like two second videos of some guy picking up a towel Uh and there'd be like hundreds of these videos and they would get like so many subscribers we're like why why like they just lowered my faith in humanity that such a channel could exist and be popular yeah oh my god yeah i wouldn't point it past anything these days oh that's gross somebody made macaroni but they put it like in no they put the hot dogs on a i'm sorry I'm, i'm just now i'm now looking down the google image search result for macaroni with hot dogs um it's weird there's a lot of this is just like a hot dog with a bunch of macaroni on the top of it instead of uh, like mustard or ketchup or anything. Anyway, I'm sorry. I got I to gotta stop looking at these pictures of macaroni hot dogs. Um, <laughs> this has gone to a weird place. Nick, why don't you tell those people online, the naughty ones, the ones that are not my friends, where they can go to <laughs> like and subscribe um, to your History Buffs channel, even though you like all the subscribers that I have fit inside of one tiny corner of your YouTube channel now. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Uh, well, you could find me on YouTube as uh, History Buffs. Uh, you could find me on Facebook at uh, History Buffs London. And you could find me on Twitter at uh, History Buffs underscore or History Buffs NH. So, or you can listen to my Vikings podcast at uh, History's Vikings podcast. Oh, okay, cool. So it's actually listed on the Vikings website? Yeah, if you go to the History Channel website, uh, you go to the Vikings section. You'll see the podcast there. All right. You're so yeah. close, man. You're so close to get me a date with somebody on Game of Thrones. I'm me and fucking Brienne of Tarth. We are going <laughs> to we are going to make magic together. We're also going to make macaroni with a little hot dogs cut up inside of it, because now that I've been looking at yeah. these pictures, I want macaroni with hot dogs cut up inside of it. If only you were a fan of Game of Vikings, then I could have pulled that off. I'm sorry. Son of a bitch.